Okay, everyone, it's nine, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started and making a few announcements. Um, thank you guys for great sessions yesterday. A special thank you to the co-chairs and, and the moderators. Um, it was a tough job yesterday, but they did a, a wonderful job. So a couple of announcements. Um, don't forget the Lost Ideas box. There are not many um, ideas out there. I know not everything is making it into the PowerPoints just by nature of, of doing this huge endeavor. So um, make sure if there's something that's not getting into the notes that you make sure we get that, um, whether that's in the idea box or emailing me or Bob, um, the idea box is preferred. But if you know, if you think about something after the workshop too, I mean, please feel free to email us something, reach out, we, we really want your ideas. Um, if anyone wants their posters posted as a PDF online, uh, send that to Michelle. Um, for reimbursements, different organizations are doing some different reimbursements, but if, if you're doing one through Carnegie, we are gonna send you an email. Just please make sure you keep your um, printed receipts. Make sure you keep those hard copy receipts. Um, you can see here that um, Michelle has put up a archive portion on our website uh, and we have the live stream footage here as well as the the powerpoints uh, that each of the breakout sessions made um, someone has lost an earbud a wireless earbud uh, so if you find that it's black wireless earbud uh, let one of us know um, there will be a taxi sign up sheet at the registration desk uh, just to try to get everyone organized and uh, out together. And I think that was all my notes. So Louise is going to come up and uh, say a few things for us. I'm just. Okay. Oh, do you need no, 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 go ahead. Hi, I'm Louise Kellogg from UC Davis, and I'm, uh, I'm also the lead of the uh, Deep Carbon Observatory's Modeling and Visualization Forum. So some of you have heard mention of the Deep Carbon Observatory here throughout this meeting. We, we focus on modeling and visualization, uh, so it connects to many of the topics that have been discussed here. And we'll be holding the, uh, I'm just mentioning that we'll be holding a workshop here in this building on December 8th, which is the day before AGU starts, so the Sunday before AGU starts, uh, on to work on and discuss and, and present and learn about what the variety of efforts around the world that are going on on modeling and visualization for deep carbon and for carbon pathways through the Earth's interior. So if you're interested in that, it, it's, there will be, uh, just stay tuned on uh, deepcarbon.net which is the DCO's website, and there'll be some announcements going up and uh, more information as you um, as we, the months go by, or you can just contact me directly at kellogg at ucdavis.edu. Thanks. Okay, so today, our final day, we really need to be thinking about the big picture. So I wanted to give you a little bit of history, tell you three stories about 10 years ago when we had the workshop, things that we learned from that, and maybe something we can take with us today. We're also gonna have a slight change to the schedule because I think that uh, we really do as a community need to be talking with each other about the big picture. So that's something we're gonna add more time for. So the idea today is to uh, wrap things up, but when I think back 10 years ago to that Deep Carbon Cycle workshop, what I recall was that uh, there was a very interesting group dynamic. The, the first thing was that on the very first day when people arrived, of course, they had friends. They had people, the volcanology community knew each other, the deep life community knew each other. These are people, and you'd see them going off and sitting at tables together and talking together in their own disciplines. By the second day, you started to see, because of the talks, because of the dynamic interactions, people much more looking at the cross-fertilization and, and talking to each other. So this really reflects the outcome of that Deep Carbon Cycle workshop. One of the things we found was that we divided ourselves rather easily into four communities, an extreme physics and chemistry community that looked at uh, the types of phases and their properties that occur in the very deep interior at high temperature and high pressure, the reservoirs and fluxes community that was brought together largely by their interest in volcanoes, but many, many other aspects of this came forward. You saw some of that last night in the biology meets subduction film, that beautiful film. Deep Energy was thinking about uh, deep organic synthesis and, and other sorts of aspects of how carbon and organic chemistry might link in the lower crust and the mantle. And we had a deep life community um, uh, led by a number of people. Rick Colwell's here, and one of the outcomes of that was the census of deep life, deep microbial life. 
So this was kind of an expected outcome, but it was this interaction that occurred. And I think what I'm very excited about here is I saw this interaction between the geo, the bio, the planetary science, the data science right from the beginning. I think we were primed for this. And so we're really ahead of the game on this, thinking about a much broader integrated idea. So, so I've been excited about the, these photographs just from yesterday at the workshop. But the third thing that happened, and this is the unanticipated sort of what you hope will emerge was, um, I'm gonna give you one example of something we had no idea that would come out of this. It was really unexpected. And in many ways, it was thanks to Dmitry Sverjensky, who's a professor of geochemistry at Johns Hopkins University. He came to the podium and he gave just a five minute talk. And it was a plea. He said, we really can't model fluids in Earth's deep interior, especially aqueous fluids, because we have no idea what the dielectric constant of water is. And without that dielectric constant of water at the high temperatures and high pressures of the lower crust and mantle, you really can't do aqueous speciation. You can't say, what are the ionic species? You can't even define something like pH for a fluid in the mantle. And so that was a simple plea. Can we find out what the dielectric constant is? And that very same day at lunch, up walks Isabel Danielle and says, I think I have a handle on this because we've been doing solubility experiments in the diamond anvil cell at high temperature and high pressure. And that solubility gives you constraints on the dielectric constant. And then Julia Galli, a theorist at UC Davis, came up and said, you know, I think we could calculate this from first principles. So Dimitri was thrilled. They got together, and what the result is something called the Dew Model. And the history is really very well spelled out in the papers. The dielectric properties of water, there's the theoretical paper that came out in 2012. and 2014, there's a Raman and thermochemical study on solubilities, which gave another constraint, an experimental constraint, and the theory and the experiments matched beautifully. This allowed the deep water, earth water model to be published in 2014. And the papers that have come from this are absolutely stunning. I'll just show you four of them. A paper on the, the fact that organic carbon in subduction zones behaves much differently than we thought it would. Diamond formation due to a drop in pH. So this is a method. You don't have to change the pressure. You don't have to change the temperature. Change the pH in a fluid. And um, uh, Fang is here, and, and I've just been thrilled to see the progress they've made. By the way, all of these papers have early career scientists associated with them. Um, this idea of immiscible hydrocarbon fluids and also the nature of organic speciation, 2017, and then relationship uh, between mantle pH and the nitrogen cycle, and the, for the first time explaining why Earth has a nitrogen-rich atmosphere and Venus does not. So these were the kinds of things, and the publications just keep coming. It's really neat. There's now a deep earth water community, a group of users, uh, many, many papers coming out. As I say, it's something we could not have anticipated, but a kind of cross-fertilization that occurred just because uh, people made comments and heard each other for this time. I hope that comes out of this meeting. I, I don't know where it will be, but maybe there's already collaborations and new ideas gestating. That would be a real thrill. So how do we foster this? How do we make this happen? Um, I think one way is that we need more time to discuss as a community and have some of these ideas coming forward. So we're gonna change the schedule a little bit. Um, I'm gonna make the breakout sessions shorter this morning because these are rather technical, having to do with, with um, data science, with uh, new visualization and analytical tools. It's extremely important, but I think that, that um, we can probably consolidate our ideas more quickly. So we're gonna have from 9:10 very soon to uh, 10 o'clock, the smaller groups, they're gonna move to the larger groups from 10 to 10.45. Then we're gonna have our breakout, uh, coffee, coffee break at that point. Right after that will be the reporting, and we want all that reporting to be done before lunch. That means that after lunch, starting about um, 1.15, we can have almost two hours of, of a plenary session where uh, I'd like us to discuss, rather than these very detailed questions of how we want to advance geoscience or bioscience, planetary science, data science. Let's look at the big picture. Because um, what we heard from the funding agencies yesterday is we need to have a clear and concise unifying theme or themes. We need to be able to use this to provide a basis. Uh, we want to write the white paper. We maybe, maybe we want to form a, a community in some informal or more structured way. 
and perhaps their grants that are coming out of this. And so it has to be clearly framed, it has to be important, and I'd like to hear ideas from everybody about how we can do that. So this is stepping back from the 12 breakout sessions and really having one big breakout session with all of us together. Um, I think we need to decide if we want to be some kind of community. We can have, a, as I say, informal or more formal ways of doing that. And we need to decide uh, what kind of interactions we have, what our leaders are going to be. So what I'm going to propose for this final session after lunch, but start thinking about this right now and be prepared to tell us your thoughts on this. What do we think are the overarching unifying themes? Um, if, how and should we organize and who's going to lead this? So with that, um, I'd like us to go to our breakout sessions. I'm going to give one more thank you to our funding agencies. This has been absolutely critical to having this. Again, please go and thank uh, Jen and Michelle for their incredible hard work. Uh, you know, I got here at, at 7.30 this morning. There's Michelle already <laughs> sitting at the desk. So she's had long days, and, and they've both been just incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, I wish us all uh, good luck in this endeavor. I think today's a really important day. I'm excited about it. Um, let's get to work. Um, we came at the problem from two different directions, so we're actually going to do two different presentations. Right? I'm going to have a co-presenter from, from Group 9B. Um, so uh, some of the things that we talked about in regards to critical needs were being able to frame some of the questions that we would use deep uh, neural networks for. Um, it's not really clear uh, which ones uh, can be used, uh, what hypothesis we should be testing. Um, you know, so really highlighting exploratory questions, what are the specific opportunities, what should we address first uh, is, uh, uh, was another critical need that our group came up with. Um, conditioning the data uh, for integration. So if we're dealing with data from different types of source, text-based, spatial, um, some of it's vector, uh, some of it had to be interpolated, like how you bring that all together uh, for using any machine learning technique uh, is a challenge. Um, and then knowing what the best tools are. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, deep neural networks aren't all created equal. Uh, some of them are more for computer vision, like deep convolutional neural networks. Um, others of them, like deep belief networks, are, for, are more for text mining. So th there's just kind of a general lack of understanding around the technical uh, nature of deep neural networks and what they can be applied to. Some of the issues, um, I know this wasn't a specific ask, but um, uh, we identified several issues before we ended up getting to our opportunities, and they didn't feel like they fit into uh, the, the things, uh, the critical, they didn't feel like needs, they felt more like problems to address. Um, but there are, there are too many specialized applications, so um, uh, for, for example, BLAST, and, and people really aren't used to maybe potentially using a more generic approach. They're very comfortable with the applications that they use today. So. Um, it might be difficult to even get people to consider using deep neural networks. And then processing things at the source. So uh, data is massive. It can be ge uh, geologically uh, uh, geo uh, distributed. You know, how do we do this sort of edge computing or processing at the source without having to have the technical skill uh, to, to do that? So Spark is one of those technologies that supports it, that's open source, that's out there, but not Many folks in the sciences know how to use it or when to use it. Um, uh, we need examples of when deep neural networks will, provi will provide results other than those that we expect. So rather than uh, finding something that we know is there, how do we find something that is unique or novel in the data? How, and how will we know once we've found it? Um, and then getting more buy-in from the community to accept um, uh, you know, to move away with the, from the tr traditional needs, that's something that I think that kind of got covered on the last slide, but um, I guess it bore repeating again here. And then much of the data is dark uh, because it has intellectual property associated with it. Um, so it can be very hard to get at some of the deeper data because it's either locked up in corporations or people haven't released it and shared it. Um, so these are some of the issues that we identified. Some of the opportunities um, that we looked at are that we will be able to potentially find emerging properties and data that, that we didn't know was there until we started using things like uh, reinforced learning, which is an, an unsupervised technique that you don't have any presupposed answer for what you're going to come, uh, come to. So that, that could be a very interesting thing where we start to see very specific patterns emerge that are novel and new to us. 
Um, the identification of black swans are rare events. Now, this is the exact opposite. Like, when you would actually bump into things that don't occur uh, very often um, might emerge uh, from the data as well. Um, it's an opportunity for us to reframe questions. You know, we may think that we've been predicting something very well, but might find that we're not predicting it as well as we could. Uh, and to use a, a computer science example, for a very long time, speech recognition hovered around 70% accuracy. With the, advocate, uh, with the invention of deep neural networks, it now hovers in the high 90s. So it's, uh, we might find that things that are just sort of limping along with the modeling method methods that we're using today might get a serious boost from moving into uh, using deep neural networks. Um, and then this might be an opportunity, too, for us to cross some of the community boundaries, you know, making models of models, taking models from other disciplines, bringing them together, merging them together in, into a, um, a deep neural network in, in order for us to find some of these emerging properties. And then, uh, you know, one of the other opportunities are we do have laws. I, I have to tell you this funny story because my uh, co-chair, Mark, I turned to him and I said, what if you threw out the laws of thermodynamics? And of course, he looked horrified, uh, as, as he should, right? But what if there is a, a, a fourth or a fifth law of, of thermodynamics that we don't know about yet, right? So uh, that's something that we could potentially discover from sort of reverse engineering, uh, directly using the raw data initially in its rawest form um, and not making assumptions. Uh, so uh, being able to pair them up, but because you have the law, you can actually validate uh, whether or not what you're finding is actually relevant. So those are some of the opportunities that our group found. Now, because we did come at this from different ways, I'm going to turn it over to the other co-chair of the other session <laughs> to come up and, uh, and discuss uh, uh, what their session covered. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, just, just to give a try to represent the, the perspective that, that emerged in the other group spontaneously. Um, all right, so I'm, I've tried to organize this sort of from the more general to the more specific, starting with broad challenges and then ending up with specific opportunities. Uh, Christopher, you should introduce yourself. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm Brennan Keller. I'm, a, I'm not actually supposed to be the, co the chair of my session even. I was the co-chair and had to take over, but uh, happy to be discussing this. Um, Thank you. Uh, okay, so starting with the broadest challenges, uh, and th these are two, the first one is sort of a challenge that we thought was particularly applicable, a, tr a challenge for the field that we thought was applicable to deep learning. The second one is a challenge that's specific to um, doing deep learning research. So uh, the first one is how do we identify the most important features in a natural system, especially things that we as humans may have overlooked. So uh, the issue of, you know, in some cases, are we missing uh, the forest through the trees. Are there you know, paradigm shifts? You know, the, the, plate, the plate tectonic revolution was something that came up in the integrated discussion later um, that could be discovered with deep learning. So that's, that's a challenge that goes directly into an opportunity. The second challenge is much more uh, implementational. Uh, how do we find collaborators in the computational science community who are on the cutting edge of machine learning, uh, given that the three bullet points on the bottom uh, I guess I'll start with the bottom. Uh, they're in high demand. It's hard, to, it's hard to recruit them. You can't necessarily just hire a computational scientist. The simplest problems that we may first think of applying things to may not be of the most interest to a computational scientist. And then there's, there's just sort of a language gap. Uh, how do we talk between these two communities? Uh, so the, some of the opportunities address these directly later on. Uh, but then before we get there, there's, there were also two more specific needs that, that would facilitate research that, that emerged in the group. Uh, one is training data sets with, with accurate labels. So uh, literature data sets, you know, if you can, in the a la, a la geo deep dive, uh, go directly to the literature, then you have all the context right there. But more, the more data sets, the better, was, was I think something that, that we all agreed on. Uh, and two is frameworks to hold Earth data. So again, uh, going to Shannon Macrostrat would be an example. So these are, these are both in progress, I would say, but uh, context. So then the opportunities uh, which emerge from the challenges. Uh, the first one, deep learning to avoid bias. Uh, as long as we can avoid transferring our human biases into uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning frameworks, which is actually an, an issue of concern right now. But if we can avoid that, that's a big opportunity. Uh, can we 
you know, we reproducibly make the same mistakes, but a deep learning framework may not be able to. Uh, and in particular, I think a key point here is, is the difference between general machine learning where we define the features of interest and then train on those versus deep learning where the system defines the features of interest. Uh, second general opportunity, um, which I think addresses the issue of how do you get buy-in from computational scientists, is use scientific problems as test cases to refine computational techniques. So essentially big open questions in the science which are easily, uh, easily explained to a broad audience and are of wide interest. Uh, using those to recruit, um, recruit computational scientists rather than just saying, um, you know, give me your computational expertise or data or something like that. Uh, three, uh, are there questions deep learning that can answer, this is really broad, broad open sky, deep, the deep learning can answer that, that are fundamentally different than what we will think of if we're just a, addressing this in a usual human way. Four, um, using, using deep learning to span disciplines, problems that span disciplines. Since Oftentimes there's a fundamental limit on how much we can keep in our head. Uh, the, the intersection between fields may emerge from, uh, from deep learning. And then five, uh, just to point out that these missing insights may be big, one of the specific, uh, specific cases that was brought up in our, uh, in our group was about uh, things like, like the alteration in, uh, in, o in the Ophiolites in Oman that is, was sort of the thing that geologists tried to avoid for a long time. You know, we don't want to look at that. that that's the, you know, as an igneous geochemist, I should say, that's gross. You know? <laughs> uh, but actually, this is a huge opportunity uh, for essentially addressing climate change issues. This is, this is potentially a, a, way, a way to solve, uh, solve global warming, in a sense. Are there insights like that that have been overlooked by people that could be found by deep learning? So that, that's, what, that's kind of a case study of what we're getting at. But then two much more specific opportunities. Uh, the way I have been thinking about you know, how, do I, how do I find a problem that would be applicable to deep, to deep learning? I think one way of thinking about it is, uh, well, deep learning is very, very good at conducting tedious tasks again and again once it's been trained. So what would you do uh, if you had 1,000 undergrads for a year? Uh, and in one case of this, but also sort of a, a, broader, uh, a broader range of topics as well, is quantifying visual data. Specifically in the earth sciences, visual data is, is really foundational in a lot of cases, but this is hard to, to quantify and to represent in a, a numerical way other than, you know, a, a bit field of images. But, uh, but with deep learning, you can often quantify this. So you can, if you have the right training data set, you can identify the modal proportions of minerals in a thin section, and then you can look at sort of second order, more complicated things, textural information, how do these crystals intersect? Uh, all of that can be extracted from visual data that has been of, have been, been of importance to the field for a long time, but has not, uh, not been quantified. All right, I think that's everything from second group. Those are great summaries, thank you, and I like the complementarity. I'm wondering, are there any other use cases ah. that you guys came up with? Because um, it would be nice to be able to point to specific needs and, um, uh, and maybe other people have thoughts about, they've heard this and have thoughts about use cases, but that would be really useful. Yeah. And that is uh, looking for organisms that uh, you find in some places, but they might be in the same type of environment elsewhere, or rare minerals. You sort of get a sense of where rare minerals occur, and therefore that may point to specific places where you could search for them. So this is combining sort of, a, in some cases, biological logic or geochemical data sets. Yeah, uh, one thing that comes to mind for me and sort of, you know, what would I do if I had a thousand undergrads for a year, it would be fill in missing metadata. And uh, doing this with, with a deep learning approach is maybe a little bit scary in that you don't have the, 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 tr the transparency may not be quite the same as if you actually walk in and ask the undergrad, oh, hey, how did you determine that this is 3.5? million years old. Uh, but the opportunity is massive if this can be done accurately. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of tack on to that, I mean, um, I've done some studies where you've used a computer to do classification of documents or generation of metadata. The computer is better and more consistent than the human yeah. is. So you don't get this sort of iterator rel uh, reliability issues that you get in association with it. So um, yeah, that's an yeah. excellent use case. Yeah, so along those lines uh, with uh, uh, text mining and uh, data mining, so 
if you give if you give a specific task, or do you have to go through kind of iterations of improving the model? So maybe the first pass of collecting you know data, you, you're you're noticing errors, you're not getting everything you want. Do you, are is there a refinement that goes into that? Um, by definition, that's the difference really between traditional machine learning methods and deep neural networks. So that refinement happens at stopping points, and you can even change the the activation function or uh, the, even the structure of the network at those interim states if it starts to head in, in an incorrect direction. So you're not necessarily trapped with starting over. Uh, so it's one of the advantages of going with the deep uh, uh, neural network instead of some of the more traditional approaches. And, and searching, so is it more of a challenge to search for something that's very specific because it's harder to find or, or very broad because then you can kind of go in a lot of directions, or if it's a very broad search, you kind of open up a lot of rabbit holes. I, I'm trying to think of when I, we did uh, a galaxy classification problem, right? We wanted to determine the age of galaxies, and we have all this Hubble uh, telescope data, right? Massive amounts of it, and um, the the uh, the first time through. Um, even after multiple stages of correction, uh, it did better, little better than guessing. <laughs> and I think that's just because there's so much differentiation in, uh, in the data itself, right? Uh, that uh, it, made, it, it made it harder to see the emerging properties, right? Um, uh, however, uh, when it was paired up with other data sources, sources that narrowed down its search at the individual layers, then it started to do much better uh, and performs now quite well, almost as well as a human at, at uh, doing identification. So it, I think we're still learning about what deep neural networks are capable of. Um, I do think that's why when I was talking about our summary, I think there are the possibilities of of coming at things from a very broad way and then narrowing them in. We're gonna learn things along the way uh, that will help us, but at the same time, I also think there is this opportunity for black swans where we're gonna find things that we just didn't expect um, that are very specific that we weren't counting on. So I hope, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you both, I think we'll move on. Then the next reporter is Erin Robinson who's going to talk to us about visualizing complex environments in earth space and life sciences. Great, so I think that this is a really a nice follow-on from the last group's discussion. Um, as Kristen um, was talking, I was thinking, you know, well, if you had visualization um, added to this, it would be really interesting. And I think it's also a really nice follow-on from the summary that Margaret Leinen gave yesterday on visualization of um, opportunities in applying new analytical and visual visualization methods for data-driven discovery. Because I think one of the big ahas from our group was really this iteration between data, the, the discovery that's coming out of the data through things like machine learning, and then visualizing them and iterating the visualizations. Um, so um, diving right in, and I liked Kristen's um, sort of lumping this all as issues. So our group, um, as we came together, we described a couple of, of different kinds of um, needs, driving questions, and these unrealized opportunities. And I think the reason that we're coming at visualization or thinking about visualization is to form hypotheses, hypotheses to um, be this bridging activity between um, different disciplines and to foster those collaborations. I think visualization as a bridging object um, is something that we find really useful. Um, and then, you know, for its more traditional kind of education and public outreach. And I think that thinking about those two different kinds of visualizations of the kind that we use for analysis and new science discovery and the kind that we use for education and potentially that those two are also iterating um, and evolving together I think is another interesting thing that this group um, came to. So the iter iterative, 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 sorry guys. Um, iterating on visualizations and also advancing the visualization field itself as data-driven discovery is pushing things along. Um, 
So I think the next point was that investigating complex environments requires us to measure um, and truly understand how the complex environments work. So there was a lot of discussion in this group about how we might layer different kinds of data sets on top of each other, the geospatial and temporal scales of those data sets, um, the kind of underlying inferences that had been made on some of the data and how that gets carried on and people eventually assume that that inference was actually an observation but then you get to the field and you realize it was actually an inference. Um, and so, you know, all of that kind of wraps up into how do we characterize uncertainty in visualizations um, and the different kinds of, um, the different kinds of types of visualizations too. Um, so one particular example that we talked about was connecting this to plate tectonics and that it gets more difficult to assess as we go back in time. So again, visualization and sparse data. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of detail in these slides, but I'm um, just hitting the high points. Um, again, in the group yesterday and again in the group today, we talked about different, um, how to compress the dimensions to visualize and explore multidimensional data and what dimensions are important and what dimensions are not important and how to make those decisions. Again, we had this not being trapped by the machine and not being trapped by 2D um, because of 3D, um, the ability to present in 3D um, and you know even 3D printing and VR Maybe it's back. Um, I think it's back. Yeah. Um, I think again, yesterday and today, there was this um, this question and this I you know wanting the black box method of um, of visual you know wanting to visualize the black box of this kind of machine learning. And from Chris yesterday, I heard that there's a workshop in Berlin in October that's focusing specifically on this um, for people that are interested in that. So visualizing the visualizer. Um, there. And then this is an absolutely not complete list of data resources and tools that exist. Again, because we, um, our use case really focused on kind of this tectonic reconstruction, G plates was brought up. Um, and there were also existing mineral and biological data um, bases that were brought up. And I think that one of the things that I would ask my group is to um, fill, this, fill this in with the other additional resources from our notes. And then I think the impediments to making progress. Um, one is missing data. As we go back in deep time, the sparse record um, was brought up as an issue. The black box method of um, what's, what's happening to our data, um, and again, visualizing the visualizer, and then identifying and tracking interferences versus data that's supported. Um, and I would ask my co-chair if there's anything she wants to add. No? Anything that anybody in the group wants to add? There was a really robust discussion in this group. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Um, and so I think the third, third of our reporters is Louise Kellogg, who's going to be talking about uh, analytical and visualization methods in data-driven discovery. There now. And I should have said that Kristen Toll is from Microsoft Corporation, Aaron Robinson is from the Earth Science Information Partners, and Louise is from UC Davis. Yeah. Here we go. So we had a very, um, we had a very wide-ranging discussion, and we prepared both the slides, but also a, a Word document that will go to the um, project writer, so that will help a little bit. Perhaps I don't. I don't know, uh, because there's a lot of uh, thank you. There's a lot of um, of detail uh, in this in what we're doing. But I, so I'm going to focus on the on some overarching themes that I think we identified. And because we're talking, our group was talking about the critical needs and opportunities to improve improve analytical and visualization methods. I thought it was important to decorate the slides with some visualizations of some sort. And the first one was the room that we met in, which is the library, which contains upstairs on the third floor. If you haven't been there, you should go in there because it contains a vis physical scientific visualization in the form of this globe that has a bunch of pins stuck in it. And I noted that it doesn't have a legend, so it's a little hard to know. I think it's the track of, some, of one of the ships. <laughs> there you go, okay. 
That's what we inferred from reading around it, but uh, it's a beautiful physical manifestation of visualization, so I thought it was worth putting in there. Okay, so um, I sorted the needs into kind of two, need, two categories, and one were what I would call the technical needs. Basically, there was a lot of discussion of we, you know, things that people are encountering that are really technical barriers, technical needs, and, uh, and technical opportunities. I didn't answer them in the form of the four questions. They're all categorized under needs, but they lead immediately to the opportunities. And so some of these, these are really kind of technical needs that, that could be addressed. And then the second category of needs were really cultural changes. And in my mind, those were in some ways the most important and the most interesting for the from the point of view of this group. A lot, a, a, a whole, within that technical needs group, a, a whole bunch of the needs really were around uh, what we might broadly categorize is understanding what is certain and what is uncertain in our data. And I, I mean that both in the sense of the formal uncertainty of the data, the errors in the data, uh, the trade-offs and so on, but also just in, in the more casual use of the word, word uncertainty. So understanding essentially where we have gaps in our data and where we have good coverage in our, in our data, understanding where the data sets are big or small, understanding the variations for models in particular, the variations in and, uh, in, and visualizing the trade-offs between uh, different parameters that are used in models and how they how they affect the outcome or the interpretation of the model, and then. Um, basically having the analytics about your data and being able to visualize that, representing the statistical significance and so on. And I decorated with the, this with a, uh, a model. I, I couldn't resist throwing in a model by my colleagues at UC Davis by Mike Oskin and his colleagues, uh, which is basically a LIDAR. Um, a LIDAR uh, data set collected after the uh, El Mayor Cucapa earthquake in, Mex in Mexico in 2010, in which they were doing change detection um, using some open source virtual reality um, software, LIDAR viewer that we've built in the Keck Caves. And so uh, what you're seeing there is basically the scarp of the fault, but you're also seeing very, very small changes that they were able to detect by repeated analysis of, of uh, multiple LIDAR scans. So this was a large data set that had to be reduced to a, a picture, but also reduced to a statistical representation of the up and down motion uh, on this fault. So, it, you know, it's got all those components in it in the visual. So that's my decoration for that one. This one doesn't have a decoration. <laughs> so this one is uh, uh, about other technical needs. And so these were, some of these were quite specific and they were really, uh, you know, came down to, I have this, I have this need and I, I can't do this now. And, and does someone know how to do that? And in some cases, the conversation around the table would be, well, yes, this exists in this other field. And so there's a, you know, a, a need to share those tools. So the, so that, the, one of the themes was basically a real desire for sharing of information, for collating of information, for creating some kind of, of uh, platform or document, or it could be very lightweight or it could be more curated to exchange be best practices, exchange known practices, exchange information about tools and how they work. Uh, and there was some, uh, some mention that, you know, something like Stack Overflow is great, except it can be a little overwhelming, so that somehow a curation of that would be helpful. Uh, and so these kinds of needs included things like being able to interactively zoom from scale to scale in a large data set, being able to see the big picture, but also zoom into a very kind of focused picture of a particular part of a data set, being able to explore relations in data um, on multiple scales, being able to include the time dimension in complex data and the relationships between those, being able to include the time dimension when there's not very much time information, there may be more other information, uh, being able to link and merge uh, data sets, um, Oops, that education one is supposed to be in another slide. Uh, tracking objects and models through time, especially for very large calculations, uh, tracking distributions in complex data sets, and so on. So those are the, those are the, they were, and there was a longer list, a much longer list that also occurs here, so I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. Uh, then, then there was a, a set of uh, general needs, technical needs that I, I'm going to broadly and probably incorrectly categorize as kind of software engineering. And by that I mean that these are things that are not necessarily directly related to anal an analysis and visualization, but they're really commonly encountered problems that really need attention and need some, you know, work on them. Some of these involve things like lightweight 
lightweight tools for rapid visualizations. Some of them involve things like standardized data formats. And I think anybody who's ever tried to work with any visualization knows that one of the things that is, can, can be a barrier step especially for someone just getting started out, is what format is my data in and what format does the software I want to use need? And so, you know, that can really, really time consuming kind of thing, but it's not really fundamentally related to the science we're doing. So then there are questions about linking and merging data sets, about software architecture, uh, and um, about how to, you know, figure out what the right software packages are, what the right tools are. Uh, these are not necessarily the easiest tools to use. I mean, you don't, what we tend to do is pick the easiest tool, but, you know, that may not be the right tool. Uh, un, and then under the same category is the provenance for visualization. So when we started, we had a thread of conversation about essentially reproducibility and replicability of science in the long term. And uh, part of that was related to, you know, what, what will happen now, what will happen in 10 years to the visualization we do now, and will it still be usable? Will, it, will we still understand what's in it? Will we still be able to, um, to work with it? Scriptable tools, multidimensional scaling, and preservation of, of visualizations. And here the decoration slide is, is a, a tool for citing software, for basically figuring out how to cite software uh, that we do at the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics. And you basically have some open source codes, and you basically select the code, and then uh, you can it'll export you uh, the text to use, recommended text to use in your publication that uses that code, including the version number and the license type. These are best practices, some acknowledgement, and a, a way to cite the code with the DOI for the code itself. So you have a DOI for the code itself, and then the primary references that are in the peer reviews liter literature, the more standard literature. So this is a, a method that I know AGU is very interested in, publishers are very interested in. Uh, there are tools out there, and basically making sure that these tools are transparent to us and understandable to us, and that we have the means to use them, and we know what the best practices are for using them. That's part of this whole story about analytics and, and visualization. Then we have the category of uh, general needs and opportunities that I would call, put under the category of cultural changes. And here the decoration is this very famous visualization of the progress of Napoleon's army towards Moscow and back. And the width of the diagram is basically the number of living soldiers and uh, associated people. And so this is a classic visualization. So it starts out on the left, very wide with a whole lot of people. And you can see them basically, the, the army getting smaller and smaller and then actually getting smaller and smaller smaller as it moves back along this direction uh, due to due largely to weather and illness. And so this is a, a, a visualization that was used in Edward Tufte's classic uh, book, The Visual Display of Quanti Quantitative Information, which came out in the 80s and is still useful. So this book really, in some sense, defines a philosophy of, vi of visualization, of data visualization. And this, vi this picture is so widely used that it has become itself iconic of a good visualization. So for some, if you've read this book or you've seen some of this, you might see this diagram and immediately say, oh yes, a good visualization. You might not even think about what it is anymore. It's become an iconic figure because of these sort of best practices. Now, it came, this book came out in the 80s, so a lot of the software tools that we have had didn't, weren't even on the horizon. They weren't even being thought of, but the practices are more universal. So that's something about this. So that's the, that goes to this top point, which is education on how to use visualization techniques. And this came up again and again in our group, how to basically train ourselves train each other to use good, to choose good visualization techniques, to figure out what works for our data, what we can get out of it, and how to best use it uh, in our scientific work. Uh, and so this education training of ourselves, both on how to use things and also how to interpret visualization. So more advanced visualizations like the network diagrams we've been seeing and other, other types, you, they're not necessarily intuitive immediately, but we as a scientific community need to get used to them and we train our students how to use them and so on. So there's a, an education kind of theme through this entire thing. <clears throat> there's an element of bringing research on visualization into practical application. I called it translational research because in computer science because by analogy to medical translational research, which is bringing research into practice. 
and uh, so this is something that came up, I think, in, in yesterday's conversation and today's, which is that there's a whole scholarly body and applied body of, of research and study and development going on that we may not know about, and, and we may have a hard time getting access to it. And so this was a huge theme that we should be able to discover and figure out what's out there, but also the things that are now at the stage of proof of concept, or they may be a publication in a, in a technical journal in the visualization world, we don't know how to, we don't have the capability yet of adapting all of those tools that might be useful to us. And so developing that is really important. And that third bullet is moving from hero code. So hero code is basically software that was written by the heroic graduate student or postdoc in the attic and they, for their dissertation or for their publication. And then when they graduate and go on, the hero code is lost, the utility of it is lost. So kind of bringing that into, into a more robust, stable, uh, developed using best practices kind of uh, tools makes it more uh, accessible and, and discoverable and also uh, basically preserves that effort. Sharing the knowledge in, in uh, tools for v analytics and visualization. Uh, a really interesting point was the idea of getting credit for failures and basically revealing transparently what we tried that didn't work and why it didn't work allowing people to get credit for sharing that information, maybe through publication or in their, in their advancement in their career, with the idea of avoiding you know, duplication of effort and learning from each other. This is part of learning from each other. And it also rewards the, the attempts to do something new and different, even if it doesn't work. Uh, best practices like licensing software, using the right software packages, access and preservation and sharing of best practices, the provenance of visualization, I think I accidentally put that on another slide as well, which is basically this idea of the long-term sustainability of a visualization. A question got asked from someone uh, about whether legacy codes, which are used, you know, get into our practice, end up holding back progress because we don't have a hard time breaking out of their use. Um, and uh, credit for early career researchers in particular when they're doing this kind of cross-cutting sort of work. And then data access and preservation is another part of this. So one of the recommendations we had a, that something could be done right now is to basically develop a, you know, some kind of resource that really uh, uh, reveals uh, and makes discoverable the tools that people are using now and what is working for them and what isn't working for them and facilitating sharing among the many disciplines represented in this room. And so I want to make that my final point about this. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or additions? Or comments from or anybody comments? else in my group? <laughs> All right, if not, um, it looks like our final reporter is Carol Palmer from the University of Washington, who is going to talk about uh, adapting big data techniques to address small data needs. Thank you, last person on the last day. Um, we took a little bit of a, a different approach, I guess, with the slides because we had we have very dense notes, and so we will bring all that together and uh, pass that on. And I'll invite my um, team members to also add because of what I've really done is just selected some high points and highlights, and particularly things that um, were recurring themes throughout our discussion, or things that maybe haven't come up so much during the course of the meetings overall. Interestingly, we started out talking about um, how we were all sort of small data champions and how pivotal and significant small data can be and it's not all about size. And so the um, use case that was brought to mind was the single diamond sample or the far-reaching conclusions that can come from one specimen. And so all of this brought back my memories of all the work I've done in the digital humanities and also qualitative social science where um, you know, the great breakthroughs come from sometimes of one very small data point. So the idea of what's small and what's small for what community um, was very important as well as the scatter of all the smallness. Now one of the main things we were really interested in and came up over and over and then when we brought our two groups together was um, how we grow small data into big data and how we scale up and that we don't really have 
fully developed um, for our sciences, the methods and standards that allow us to do that. And on top of that, um, while our question in front of us was how do we bring big data techniques to small data, again, um, we return to the idea that there are the applications and the software that we need and the data science approaches we need don't really exist yet. And that what we really need to concentrate on, and our second group really brought this back, was um, the concentration for small data needs to be on data sharing. And there was a lot of, again, discussion on what the sticks and the carrots are with that. And how it all comes back to human resources and funding sources and development of real services um, for um, users who are coming to the data and sustainability of that. Um, the need for computational power to generate small data for a particular task um, was uh, examined quite deeply in our group. Um, and there is some feeling that cloud computing could help where in many ways we're often just working with um, a, sp a specific server. But we had um, a long discussion about the uses of GenBank and a very interesting idea that there's no way to turn the freight train around, that the kinds of materials that um, the researchers in our group wanted to be able to pull out of GenBank are not capable, it's not capable of producing that. And it's more of a, a user orientation and not being able to be responsive to the kinds of questions that small uh, data researchers have. So the way of building services and maintaining a repository and the design and the architecture of that repository is very much part of that. And that part of, and in order to maintain it, you have to have the documented systems and also the data. The idea of validity came up, and I find this very interesting because there's a, um, a theory out there about evidential cultures and how they differ across uh, different domains in terms of what they consider valid and meaningful. And so one evidential culture may find uh, validation very different than another. And so while validity is a common problem and there's challenges for small data, um, we don't share the same ideas about validity across the different disciplines. And that this is very much an educational problem as we want to work and combine communities and the data they, they um, are uh, generating. There was um, a lot of suggestion that the answer for um, building big data out of small repositories, for instance, may come from the middleware, um, and that middleware is where all the answers will be designed, and that the tools um, will be um, laying in the middle course. But of course, again, this involves much of the human um, applications. Okay, so um, again, we did very selective um, uh, pr production here, but so aggregation was probably the major theme we heard, um, the most strongest theme. And one of the major points of aggregation for small data seen again for this group was around locality. And the MIN data folks had a lot of great stories about how um, we need to do cross comparisons across different mineral sites and be able to identify patterns from big data. And then also the people who are doing species work talking about cross data sets for species. And this brings to mind all the problems that we've discussed earlier in the meeting about the long tail context problem. So as you pull data from across the different databases that we are losing context and we're losing provenance and that the enrichment of data is the biggest problem. And so in order to get complete data, we are going to need to work on small data aggregations. Now, we have over 2,000 domain repositories in the, the biggest directory we have of domain repositories. Over 600 of those are geoscience. And so we have perhaps the fundamental um, raw resources for complete data, but we don't have the means to aggregate them. Okay, and another, again, I put this under opportunities, I think because 
we saw it as a problem and a challenge, but also the thing that's unique about small data in that we should stop calling it small data and start calling it handcrafted artisanal data. <laughs> and we want to build community expertise um, through what we call data jams. And again, these will focus once again on metadata, context, and best practices. And I can't say how many times best practices came up as the major, major problem. Okay, so barriers, uh, data resources are not optimized for small data researchers. They're distributed um, through hundreds of geoscience and thousands of other repositories. Finding data sets are nearly impossible. Um, is they are not searchable by the structures we need. There are no APIs for the kinds of um, things we need to pull out, and the queries are not there that, to make um, the kinds of searches that answer our questions. And there's a lack of computational power to work against these structures that are not working. So databases are not scaled um, for big, databases not scaled for big data problems, are, and therefore we are unable to mine one gene or one specimen across many, many databases. I couldn't, uh, I could, had trouble getting uh, our group to talk about data sources. I also had that trouble getting them to really reflect on the big data techniques that might apply because there was so much focus on the best practices. But historical data came up as, of course, with deep time as one of the major um, aspects and areas that we need to really invest. And that much, much of the historical data is actually in the literature, in which we've heard about with the uh, deep data dive. Um, and a big example came from MINDAT with the big data techniques for um, OCR improvement. So while OCR is a great benefit, and there's many data sources that we were drawing from in OCR, it seemed like that one of the best applications for big data um, techniques would be to do massive improvement and enrichment of OCR. And then on top of that, for uh, the historical data, is the data rescue approach. So domain-specific databases are where the value is at. It's where the expertise lies. Um, but much concern about how we use ontologies to actually bring these to together and combine the resources. So that's the end of the slides. And so, like I said, there's many, many more that we haven't been able to um, integrate here. But I wanted to close with one of the interesting observations that I thought um, reflects on this idea of uh, the real expertise that goes into artismal small data. Um, and the fact that um, there was a feeling amongst the group that the problems that small data researchers face are, are really producing an inequity overall in the research and in the actual recognition of research. And so the idea was, well, can we turn, we can't turn the freight train, GenBank freight train around and get them to really implement and um, accommodate all the needs. But is there a way to really bring attention to the value, the significance of small data? Um, and maybe it really is solving this problem of what we uh, acknowledge and respect against uh, these various evidential cultures. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments on, or from anyone from this group that would like to add anything? Hi, uh, Anirudh Prabhu from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I just, um, I like the discussion about, you know, combining small data sets into larger data, but my question is more tended towards many other use cases where it's just not possible. Like, how many samples are you get, gonna get from Mars to actually form any kind of big data or even medium-sized data? Uh, did you guys have discussions, you sh surely must have, uh, about, you know, creating a framework, uh, not just best practices, you know, these techniques work, these techniques don't work, these techniques can be tweaked or modified in certain ways. Just, uh, I thought, you know, it would, be, it would be valuable to get a group of people together to understand their expertise, their experiences on 
what would work and not. You know, something like transfer learning might work for some use cases, might be transferable to other use cases. Some might right. not. No, absolutely. And I think um, while we started to talk around those things, we never really got deeply into it. Although many, even my co-chair, Fei-Fei, was able to talk about the um, uh, approaches that she's been using. But that's what the data jam um, would be all about, um, is really trying to bring together in some kind of community intensive way um, how we really start to learn the experiences that people have had, the use cases, and can we optimize, how, which ones can be optimized for small data? How do we um, fill the gaps, do the right kind of fitting, and um, really move the big data approaches forward where appropriate? Because there's a lot of skepticism in my group about there being even appropriate ways to move forward. And again, that has a lot, I think, of implications for the validity issues um, and the acceptance of those validity um, requirements across the different fields. Thank you. Ross, did you have it? It's Ross Lyons, Tasmania. Um, I think that the, the most important thing about small data is to go and collect more data and turn it into medium to big data. Uh, you see a lot of publications based on small data sets, uh, especially those through time Examples of, for instance, uh, a data set on the Proterozoic, uh, five samples. That's one sample every 200 million years. Is that useful? No, it isn't. I think we've, we've just got to face the fact that we need more data and we've got to go out and collect more data. Thanks. I agree. I'm a, I'm a big fan and advocate for data inventories and data audits. Um, and again, identifying the problem that we have inventorying the resources or the evidence we have around the problem and then really targeting the data that we go after. But doing that in a systematic way that really prioritizes the things that will fill the gaps, the things that are truly complementary, the things that will be pivotal and turn that corner. Now, I think it is true that there are there's small data, there's individual data. I think in brain research, we see this all the time. There's one brain that solves schizophrenia. You know, there, there can, well, that's an overstatement, but again, there are very small specimens that can have big answers and move a whole field or a whole paradigm forward. So I don't think we should discount the value. And again, thinking about how do we understand and actually make transparent the um, concept of significance as opposed to size or um, quantitative value. Are there any other or any comments that, any, does anybody think anything was missed in this, in this Well, discussion? yeah, in my group, please. Uh, like I said, we, we didn't highlight uh, many of the things that we had a deep discussions about. So co-chairs and others, please feel free. I know it's the last session. Everybody's eager. But. The idea box for the extra question. <laughs> idea box. There but you it, go. <laughs> it is Thank interesting you. to see that there do seem to be some common themes that are emerging throughout this. So. That was a fantastic session. Thank you to, to all of you who participated. Um, so we're going to have lunch now. After lunch, though, we are going to come back and have one last plenary session, which is basically an open mic effort for us to think about what are now the overarching integrating ideas. Uh, what do you think we should do as a community to organize ourselves? It sounds like, for example, there's some ideas for workshops or maybe some small group meetings that uh, we might be able to find some funding for those if there are people who want to organize them and have more focused groups. And those could then lead to their own proposals and so forth. So, so over lunchtime, talk about this. Come back at 1.15. I know some of you have to leave. And so what we'll probably do is, is you know, the first people to the mics can be the people who have planes that are um, later on this afternoon. But I, I really think we're very, very close to coming to some, some rather clear focus on where we can go. We just need a little bit more effort, a little more time. Let's go have some lunch. See you soon. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming back. In many ways, this could be the most important session of the whole workshop, because here's where ideas will really begin to crystallize. And my sense right now, and I, and I do want to have this discussion, is that there's probably not at this point a single overarching, single concise, clear idea that's both important and in a sense, um, if you will, fundable or could, that we could even write up as a single uh, concept. But I have heard maybe half a dozen really large, important ideas that I think could be the core 
of, of future work, subgroups, maybe um, collaborators who want to submit a proposal and develop some kind of thing on their own. And what I'd like to do in this session, think about this idea. Uh, we heard in the funding panel yesterday that what people are looking for, and I think what we also need as a community, is ideas that are clear and concise, maybe that can be expressed in a single sentence to describe why they're important, that are also important to the field. Um, I don't care how risky they are at this point. I think we should just sort of think about how can we organize ourselves. So in a sense, this is just open mic night. Um, people should come up and sort of get the ball rolling with idea. Uh, some of us will be taking notes and try to consolidate those. Uh, and uh, one thing I'd really like to know is if I've seen a lot of people sitting around tables with the very intensive discussions. Have you come together? Have you formed some sort of new collaboration? Have you thought about a new idea? Um, a little later on, I can tell you about one that I think is emerging in, 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 in with me and Ross and a few other people. But um, would anyone like to start this setting? And I'm not going to even stand up here. I think we should just have the mics open. Either come up to the podium or go to one of the mics and, and share with us. Okay, uh, I'm Dwight Bradley and uh, sort of semi-retired USGS and semi-affiliated with Dartmouth College <clears throat> and a, a geologist who specializes in earth history and tectonics. And I just wanted to uh, get a theme out here that uh, hasn't been, has been touched on but not really articulated. And that is that we, um, there are, well, okay, there are two ways, two broad ways of approaching Earth history. And one is sort of the, the paleogeographic approach that G-plates would, would uh, be a good example of, where you can reconstruct the plates and the environments in which particular rocks formed and get rates of plate motion for a certain amount of time. But the rock record does this. Okay, if this is now, there's a lot of rock, go back in time, you're back to the first rock at 4.2 billion or the first zircon at 4.3 something. Um, there's just not a lot to go on if you're trying to reconstruct what the plates looked like at say 4 billion years, there's one rock. Um, so we need a different approach and that is by way of time series. Um, you can still, even though you don't have, you don't know the, the particular con, uh, context of something that's really old, you can still count uh, examples of, for example, in my, my work, passive margins back through time, or the uh, composition of biotite, the, the, the uh, vanadium content of biotite back through time. You can get many hundreds of secular records like that that all correlate to one thing, that is time, or they all are a function of time. So there are these two different, uh, just to sum up, there are these two different approaches that are needed at uh, four different parts of Earth history. The one where we can be very specific and the other where we're more like generalizing things about variables that have changed through time. So it's sort of like with the, the astronomical ladder. You can do more things with close up objects than with far away ones. So, yeah. Go a little bit more on this and maybe have some I do see linking this with biology for sure because we have seen these genetic trees that, that are calibrated by their time scale uh, versus uh, our equivalent of that, which are uh, plate trees that are uh, calibrated according to by geochronology and the rock record. And so far those have been very, uh, just barely merged. Um, and there's a huge opportunity, I think, in the, in the long run in trying to consolidate the, the biological and the geological time scales. Can I add something? Yeah. There is uh, another solution, just to use 3D mental convection models. 
because then you can create plate tectonics and you can see the evolution of ah. plate motion. Very good point. So yes, we add a third approach. <laughs> Can I make a comment? There? Yeah, Ross. Um, I think one thing that we haven't talked much about, and it's really important with the time series work, is having really good geochronology. Um, with our radiometric dating back in the Precambrian, uh, we've probably got um, reasonable dates, but we need a lot more of them. But in the Phanerozoic, where radiometric dating isn't so useful, we're, we've got the fossil record, of course, but we, we need a lot more work, I think, especially when you work on black shales. I mean, rhenium osmium dating seems to be very popular, but it's very expensive and very slow. Um, we need to be thinking about other more rapid uh, dating methods. So I'll just throw that in. Yeah, I, it's absolutely. It's a limiting factor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, going back 40 or 50 years, it was very hard to, to date any rock. And now, uh, more and more rocks are getting fairly high resolution, high, high um, good ages, but not all rocks. And so, yeah, we need to keep at that new methods, but also uh, apply established methods to more rocks. And that's, that's not very fundable sometimes. So I just want to follow up on another comment. I think it is good to look inside the earth, you know, the, the rocks didn't disappear from the earth, they're still there. They just went down that way. So if we can look at them, and I think, you know, mantle convection is one way to do it. But of course, I, I don't think the models have very good predictive capabilities. We're using very, very crude rheologies, things, the uncertainties are enormous. For example, for, to find the old plates. Yeah, or just the mantle convection models themselves are extremely uh -huh. crude. They use a very, very, uh, basic assumptions that aren't verified by any observations mm. that we have. Actually, they're contradictory to a lot of <laughs> observations, so we have to be careful about how we do that. But the plate tectonic history is coupled to heat transfer in the mantle, and that is coupled to the core's evolution, the age of the inner core, the strength of the magnetic field through time, which is coupled to paleomagnetic data, and so there's, there's a lot of connections there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I'm wondering, um, in terms of the secular variations you talked about, um, I'd also like someone from the biological community to talk both about protein evolution and also paleobiology. To what extent um, is, is that a direct chronological link as opposed to an indirect uh, protein or proteomic link? Sorry, Dan. So, yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I think a major theme uh, that we can sort of latch onto in starting to write a white paper from all of this is uh, really, you know, the merging and, uh, what do I want to say, the merging and correlation of different databases. And we've mentioned, you know, during the course of the past two and a half days, we've mentioned a lot of specific examples of databases here. But m most of those databases, you know, as we've been talking about, have never talked to each other before. And if we can identify concrete examples, you know, for example, the protein database, you know, proteins with particular metals in them that have geologic ages associated with them, and our mineral databases, many of which have geologic ages associated with them, you know, those are two different worlds that probably have something to do with each other that have never talked to each other before. Those data sets have never talked to each other. So if we can identify some concrete examples and get together people in this room who either you know, are in charge of those databases or have the data science know-how to work with those databases and put them together and identify concrete ways in which you know, let's try to merge this database in this database and look at what variables correlate to each other. Because if there's even one variable that they have in common, and oftentimes it's going to be a time axis, uh, then all of a sudden we get those variables talking to each other for the very first time and new science is going to emerge. So I think we should be thinking about examples of, of that yeah. that we can do with databases that we've all, you know, presenters presenting the slides have already talked about. Yeah, thank, thank you for that comment. In fact, a little of that has already happened at the posters and tables today, so. 
Yeah, from the um, uh, biology side and uh, metabolism evolution. So, so something we were talking about in visualizing complex environments earlier today, we were talking about um, using G plates to look at plate tectonics, but that goes back, I don't know, 750 million to a billion years ago. So as some of the other folks were talking, th thinking about modeling uh, plate tectonics four billion years ago would allow us to think about how tectonics was involved in um, metabolic evolution from the beginning. So it's, there's not a lot of geochemical evidence for ancient metabolisms, but you know, three and a half billion years ago. So it would be easy to go back, search, uh, you know, search the literature, get all the um, <coughs> geospatial information for all that evidence, and then link that up to modeled plate tectonic systems and see how, if we can model what the plate tectonics looked like back then, see how all these different um, uh, biological signatures uh, correlated through, uh, through uh, space. Yeah, and, and so from the plate tectonics angle, uh, what you would be able to do for th three and a half billion years would be uh, come up against two or three competing worldviews um, of whether plate tectonics, sensu stricto, uh, even was taking place or some other form of, of tectonics. And then also uh, uh, an inability to, to do more than draw cartoons of what the Earth might have been like because of, like I said before, the, the sparseness of the record. So much of it has disappeared. Uh, yeah, at the comment about uh, mechanism and chemistry and dynamics. So, you know, you were mentioning, and uh, everyone agrees that there's, you know, you have the two temporal record records, the geologic and the biologic. Um, and inherently in the sort of geologic temporal record, you often also are talking about dynamics and, and mechanisms of change. And I just want to say that on the biologic side, there's huge opportunities there for really doing sort of comparative analyses, uh, you know, systematically within phylogenies and whatever to see how the appearance of some particular innovation could lead to dynamics that you then can start thinking about looking for uh, in the geologic record. So kind of on the bi biologic side, really thinking about mechanisms and dynamics that you can try to like use to line up. So not just looking at time, but also at the mechanism, and using those mechanisms to line up to the time you see on the geologic. Yes, it's a very good point. Uh, uh, Craig, yeah. Craig Schifferies. I wonder if we might benefit from consideration of what I'll call one of the greatest blunders and failures of 20th century geology, which was the lack of discovery of plate tectonics until the 1960s. <laughs> it was patently obvious for decades before that that many of the continents fit together like puzzle pieces. We had tremendous data about geologic formations that continued on opposite sides of the Atlantic. We had glacial striations on opposite sides of the Atlantic that matched up. We had fossil occurrences on opposite sides. We had these preposterous explanations of islands that popped up and then disappeared and the animals hopped across them. What we lacked was a deep time data infrastructure that allowed us to integrate these disparate data sets and come to a, some observations in a coherent way, what we lacked was a mechanism, arguably Wagner set us back you know, 100, 100 years by proposing an implausible physical mechanism, but it was the lack of a deep time data infrastructure that I think prevented a more coherent set of observational data from making this case long ago. Yeah, so what, what plate tectonics like paradigm are we ignoring? <laughs> um, um, can I build on that with a couple of slides? Oh, yeah. Right. Right. You take the podium. Why are you <laughs> Dave, why don't you make your comment while she's setting up? Yeah, I just want to get a little more biology in here, and that is that um, with the discovery of a lot more organisms and more cultures, uh, people are more and less obliged now to publish lipid analyses of these uh, organisms when they publish them. And so there's this big literature out there of lipid biosignatures uh, you know, in 
lurking around in publications. It really has not been organized into a, a database. And we are now uh, in interpreting microbial mat communities uh, in part by, by looking at lipid biomarkers uh, that actually have more sensitivity than genetic analyses for determining uh, populations of organisms at, at low levels. And, you know, this, of course, is one step away from now looking for these biomarkers in the rock record, and there's novel techniques now for getting them out uh, it, that uh, could uh, extend the record back. And so just having a database uh, of lipid biomarkers uh, that are aligned with the various organisms that produce them could give us a handle for understanding not only the presence of life in early ancient rocks, but also what the little critters are up to. And, uh, but there's, there's not really an organized database that's taking advantage of this constant flow of new, 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 new data coming in in, in micro packets into the literature. Okay, um, so this came out of discussions over the last couple of days, which have been very fruitful. And I mostly want to highlight a framework that I think Shannon didn't spend enough time talking about the first day and thinking about uh, the structure that all of our data could be organized in, and that is the geologic rock record and the geologic map. Um, even though it is imperfect. So uh, Shannon likened this to an observatory in the way that we made a map of the stars uh, before we went to study one or two stars in particular. And so this is a geologic map and think about it in its thickness as well as the map surface area of the shallow crust. So to do 4D, this uh, deep time data-driven discovery, I think we should really think about working in 4D, so the space, spatial temporal continuum of the upper crust. And what Shannon's been doing that he didn't spend a lot of time talking about is integrating the global geologic map uh, and making it a very usable a data set. So this is the, the coarsest scale, but if you zoom in at any one location, you will find very high resolution geologic map data in particular for North America, but he has a lot of maps that he is, is digitizing and adding at this point. Um, and that's all coupled with the stratigraphic, the volume data of MacroStrat. Um, so you can do things like search for all of the Precambrian units and calculate volumes, areas, thicknesses by lithology. Uh, you can look for all of the carbonate bearing units. So this is uh, in our backyard here and get a sense for um, the, the data. Um, I think another thing that's really nice is it has uh, a lot of metadata already associated with it that you could then pull. Um, so this is just one unit and all kinds of comments on ages and everything else. Uh, it is also linked to GeoDeepDive, which I think is already very powerful, right? So this, uh, this unit has uh, 20 papers that immediately come up associated with it uh, that you could then query. And so there's a platform that exists, a scaffold, to overlay the data that we have, in my mind, have taken out of the context of this spatial temporal continuum. Um, I've been focusing on the high resolution stratigraphic data structure of the Precambrian, right? So thinking at the bed scale and the patterns of uh, stratigraphy and facies uh, at the highest resolution, that could also be integrated into this platform. Um, I thought I'd just plug this again. So he's made an app that's incredibly user-friendly called Rocked um, that has the exact same information as the, as the um, online interface, and this is signups by months, so it's taking off. 
But what I would propose is that one effort that comes out of this uses this platform of um, this spatial, temporal, uh, global geologic map um, and think about taking a time interval like the Neoprotozoic to the Ordovician, something that's near and dear to my heart, and use a case study approach to tackle some of the major problems that we've talked about here. So we integrate the macro stratigraphy as well as high resolution stratigraphy and the paleobiology that's already in the paleobiology database. We take a geo deep dive and we actually try to do some of the things that we might want it to do. So um, pull out subsets of image-based data from publications associated with this study pull out a uh, subset of time series geochemistry and biomarker data. And this platform, in some sense, is already integrated with things like the paleobiology database. It's also integrated with G-plates, rotational model, um, age constraints can be added, um, Earth systems models I think would be really fun to integrate in this platform. So this is another proposal, but it takes the, the map as the platform to organize everything by. Wow, that's amazing. Um, you could also, of course, add paleo-bio and uh, the cheap play, because we know a lot about Ordovician faunas and, and their distribution. It's a key time for the transition of life on land, and that's a really exciting um, possibility. Do you have a group together now? <laughs> Um, no. You want to leave <laughs> so, one? so Shannon and I are just dreaming this up, right? But uh, I think that there, from my mind, in working on this time interval, I see a lot that we could be missing by having groups that are focused on the Phanerozoic, groups that are focused only on the Precambrian, and that aren't spanning the transition with uh, this uh, integrated approach. I think there are two things uh, missing from the geo deep dive. Um, in addition to geochemistry and biomarkers from this interval, you also want to probably look for uh, ichnological structures, bioturbation indices. Obviously, this is a big time for changes in, in substrates. Um, and the other thing is data on facies, um, sedimentary structures, lithologies, in addition to your carbonate database, obviously. There's yeah. lots that could be done with classic data so right. while using this, this resource. Yeah, so, so Drew, the, we obviously have focus on carbonates, but especially given a mixed carbonate siliciclastic succession, we also have siliciclastic successions within the high resolution facies approach to thinking about uh, bioturbation through time, which we can track um, at the broadest scale by environment with what we've done thus far. Um, but I think it, that you're exactly right. You know, like there are things that I didn't put up during lunch because I wanted to keep it brief. More comments on this idea. Um, I do think the idea of, of, of use case is really a, a really important way to go when you're starting to think about such a huge project as all of Earth through all of time. It, it, we, it's nice. Um, so this is the kind of thing, once again, where uh, it's possible that having a, a, a workshop on this specific idea, a working group, and maybe only a dozen people, but are there people who would be um, eager to kind of participate in something like that? All right, so this is something that we'll, we will consolidate and we'll be sending out ideas and um, continue being in touch with everybody here, but I, I do think that's really a powerful way to move forward. We found this with the Deep Carbon Observatory. As soon as you had a smaller working group with this very clear and specific idea, you get together, you have a workshop, you talk through it, you write the proposal, um, and, and maybe you bring a, a funder to that meeting as well with getting some preliminary indications of interest. That's, that's a very powerful one. Thank you. Of course. So, just wanted to add here that um, I think this is really cool, um, and I would say that from the biological dynamics that there's, I think, big opportunities for not just thinking about fossils and biomarkers because a lot of things are not going to leave behind physical obvious markings, but you know, people trying to work on the microbiological side, for example, and looking for indirect signals coming from isotopic dynamics or coupled isotopic dynamics that are not immediately obviously tied, but if you were to put them within a microbial logical context, you might be able to come up with those kinds of things. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I'd add that I think some of the power of the time interval to focus on here is that questions, a range of questions of uh, around biology are approachable with this time interval, right? We're not immediately going to the far deep time where we have very little rock record, no preserved biomarkers, et cetera, no preserved isotopic signals. I, um, I really like this idea of using with case study, and I was thinking instead of just the time interval, I spoke briefly with Shannon, and uh, I already spoke with the rest of the team, biology meets subduction, we could do the same on a specific location for a time scale that is yeah. conceivable, for example, in the subduction zones, one turn, two turn, three turn, how many turns we want to go back, and integrating in the same location, how things change it over time. And in that case, we have, for example, a lot of other data we could up on top of this. So in this case, instead of using a time interval, will be a location on Earth where we know a certain process has been going on for a long time and integrate, again, the biological side and the evolutionary side with what we get out. So potentially, we have two different case study we can integrate. One is location specific, looking how time dynamic changes, and one is time specific interval and look how things change. That's yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, Rick Carwell, I would just add to that. Uh, I agree that the biology meets subduction is a perfect sort of site where uh, this could, um, I guess, data from that location could populate this, but also the census of deep life developed by the through the Deep Carbon mm -hmm. Observatory has places all around the world, uh, marine and terrestrial, that might also be uh, nicely placed into this. So. I think, I mean, this particular figure is especially interesting to me because yeah. we're frankly having some trouble sometimes reckoning with exactly what the details of that geologic setting might be, including climatology and so on. Right. Yeah. Just um, to, to go back to this, right, I focused at the end on one possibility, but to echo your point, thinking about the modern observations that you're making in the context of the rocks that the fluids are moving through, for example, um, and organizing it in this scale, I think might help patterns emerge. Right, and I know that, um, that for instance, scientists with the, uh, the USGS, in some cases, or the University of Victoria, have thought about uh, hydrologic factors, and that would include things like recharge into the subsurface in these different locations, which of course is important for the chemistry and certainly we think the microbiology. So uh, I think this is great. I want to be a part of it. Can I respond with a software demonstration? Absolutely. Come on up. <laughs> Uh -huh. USBCs up there for the max. Yes, the max. I do. And while you're going up, I wanted to ask uh, Karen Lloyd made a tremendous point uh, yesterday about the idea of a an app for your phone. When you look up, you can see the sky. What about looking down and and seeing what's underground? This might be a great. It's obviously you can't do the whole world all the time, but if you focused on, on one time period as a test case. And, and, and Dawn, I'd love to hear more information from you if you know something about you know, how we can tackle this 3D subsurface. Uh, that's also a be beautiful illustration, sure, yeah. While we're getting this set up. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And at, at Esri, we often uh, participate in uh, small projects where we will build uh, prototypes uh, for for scientists. So this is something that I would be happy to uh, broach to uh, our teams because as you saw in the video I showed yesterday, we, we have that capability in our ArcGIS Pro. Uh, we are porting that uh, to, uh, to the web at some point, but we have this uh, free open source app that's called Web App Builder for people to undertake this uh, on their own, but this is the perfect fodder for a nice prototype project. So I'll, I'll talk with my team about that. So I'm, um, I'm a biologist, I guess I'll say that up front. So I'm really excited by all the geological um, 
inputs and insights that I've been getting. And I think the, the map aspect um, of software is something that really fascinates me. So I, day to day, think a lot about how we can visualize these big microbial data sets in a way that's a little bit easier to deal with instead of having a text file that sits on your computer for three months while you write some R code. Um, so I have a project specifically funded from the Sloan Foundation, which is meant to uh, facilitate data analytics as a normal part of the, the scientific workflow in, in the microbial, microbial ecology side of things. And um, the focus here is really on developing visualization software that is easy to access. So if I send it to a collaborator who's a taxonomist who doesn't code, they can just as easily access the visualizations and explore the data sets. Um, so the project is called Finch. Um, where are my slides? Anyway, uh, so it's finch.org. Um, this is currently a web server implementation, but it, we're transitioning over to a desktop app. And uh, think of this as an extensible framework, so it doesn't really matter what type of data set you're uploading, as long as you have a, an Excel spreadsheet or a tab delimited file of samples and observations, along with some sort of contextual data, metadata, then you would be able to visualize it. And so we focus really on an interface that's simple, so you have your text file that you would just simply upload into a text box. Um, and the software is parsing everything. So everything you see on screen is generated on the fly based on what's in your text file, what observations, what made metadata. Um, and if you've used the flight website kayak.com, where you can manipulate your flight timings and things like that. So we designed a, a parser window that's designed for data filtering. So if you want to subset your data, a lot of what the work I do is I'm interested in a specific set of taxa or a specific set of environmental parameters. Um, so you can very easily manipulate your sample by dragging, um, and the samples in the middle get updated in real time. So whatever meets the criteria, in this case for uh, ammonium concentrations and, and sulfide in the sediment samples, the samples get updated in real time. And, um, and then you can essentially visualize the, these are microbial OTUs, so operational taxonomic units. Think of them as species in your data set. Um, this is built in conjunction with the data visualization studio, so I emphasize that scientists have not built this tool. So I'm actually the end user saying this is what I want from my data, and they are um, generating the software visualizations in a way that meets my needs as an end user. Um, and the focus is on interactive exploration, so immediately, and this is uh, live on a web service, so this is um, all happening within my browser. You can toggle between absolute values or if you want to normalize your data sets. Um, we deal with taxonomic data a lot, so you can click down the taxonomic hierarchy and regenerate your bar charts. Um, hovering over any sort of uh, data point will give you additional information about the taxa in your data set and the, um, the number of counts of that observation. We have features such as autocomplete, so if you're interested in nitrogen cycling taxa, uh, you can start typing and it will autocomplete based on what's in your data set if you're looking for a specific microbe involved in nutrient cycling. Um, and then we have different visualizations. So these visualizations are changing. Uh, we have three more years of funding from the Sloan Foundation. So if you're interested in developing interactive workflows that are really rapid, um, I, I'd love to talk further to try to get your data sets into this and, and um, chat about your needs as an end user. So this is a, an example where the, um, the, sh the circle size correlates to abundance. So the larger the circle, the more microbes of that uh, um, group in your data set. And again, you can go up and down taxonomy. Um, clicking on any sort of data point gives you more information, and it gives you information about what is um, basically the distribution of that species across your samples. So we're thinking right now a lot about maps. So I would love to be able to take all these microbes and take the sample sites and just visualize them on a map. I think it's possible with the APIs. Um, we just would need to know the types of um, resources that are available in the geosciences community. Um, any sort of databases. If, um, we've been thinking a lot about how to pull information from public databases. I think a lot about, I would like a picture of the organism on this bubble. And then if I'm looking at a, a, a giant chart of bubbles, I want to have little pictures of all the organisms. So um, worms versus crustaceans versus microbes. And get a, as a taxonomist, get a better picture of how these OTUs relate to species better. 
Uh, and eventually, this will allow export of publication quality graphics. So we're working with the, the Data Visualization Studio to be able to uh, um, drag and drop visual elements and basically compile your, your publication graphic in this framework and then um, have ability to export that graphic and just put it in your manuscript. Um, I am a firm believer in efficiency in the scientific workflow, so I think about how I can reduce the time to science. I really like that phrase. Um, and then sharing data sets. So we're thinking about ways where you can permanently archive your data set in this visualization tool as a way to accompany your publication. So instead of having to spend two weeks trying to download someone's data from GenBank, you would just send them a link or, um, or a, um, a DOI to a visualized file and then people could just explore the data set and, and you know, put it on a map. So I think the, I'd love to get some feedback or some suggestions, but I'd also like to get data sets. So if anyone has data, especially microbial data that they'd like to put into this framework and work together to, to visualize samples in a way that you, are, you can't currently do, I would love to chat more. So I've got a question for you that has to do with a general theme that's recurred several times at this conference, both in the sessions we've heard, the breakouts, and, and in some of the posters. And that has to do with this question of taxonomy, which is really general. We talked about taxonomy of planets. There's a poster on taxonomy of meteorites. Um, and I've been extremely interested in the taxonomy of minerals. And let me give you an example of the problem. The mineral species are defined as a particular crystal structure and composition, that's all. But if you look in nature, some mineral species, as they're called, diamond, which is pure carbon, with a particular structure, actually occurs in many different forms. There's, there's a type of diamond that occurs in the envelopes of exploding stars by chemical vapor addition, but there's other diamonds that form at high pressure and tight, high temperature by different means. So diamond, in fact, if you did a database of all the known diamond specimens, you'd find them clustering in various places and be distinct types. So this idea of a natural classification scheme where we have large data resources and it can point us to how nature itself is divided into groups, types, and kinds. And that can be in almost any field that we've talked about um, in addition to microbiology. So I would like to develop um, the best methods for determining natural types and kinds from large data resources. Yes. I agree. So I see similarity in how I think about taxonomy. So we have the historical taxonomic classifications, which are hierarchical, but that doesn't tell us anything about the morphology. So different uh, worms in different groups would have different mouth parts, and you can have the same mouth part kind of, um, which in an evolutionary context may be similar, may not be similar. So I see that as a type of layering of data. So you might have this, this classification, but then you also have other contextual data, which you would want to put on top. So, and I see a, a visualization for framework where you can essentially add layers to the onion or peel layers away from the onion, and you can make it either as complex and data rich or as simplistic as you want it to be. And that would be, in my vision, completely defined by the user whether or not you wanted to incorporate that additional data which is useful for your interpretation. Sorry? Oh, sorry. So I'm at UC Riverside. My name's Holly Bick. Um, I have business cards if anyone wants to take one away afterwards. Um, but my email is, uh, it's just my name, so H-O-L-L-Y dot B-I-K at U-C-R dot E-D-U, but you can Google me, and it's easy. This is brilliant. You can have all my data. <coughs> this is I will take all your amazing. data. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't used this. I'm just missing out. Is there something, um, no, really, this is so good. <laughs> is there something to the locations of the clades in the bubble plot that you're showing right now, or is not, not right, now, right now, but the we want to know what you want to visualize. So there is um, the data is is essentially databased underneath this. So we can add visual elements. We can add sorting features depending on what you want to do with it. I mean, I would like to add a little bit more data. And the reason I've been keeping this quiet is because we're still in a prototyping phase. So we are oh, just okay. about to cool. relaunch I this. Missed anything. Yeah, um, but we could easily add on elements. So I think about maybe um, having taxonomy relate to shape or relate to color. We could do things like that. Um, we haven't made any decisions. We've just refactored the code. So all the visual elements are yet to be decided. So uh, yeah, we should chat more. Are you more. thinking of something that's sort of hard-coded to say that this clay does looks like this or something that could be user-derived? Like, I consider this clay to be important for ammonium oxidation in my context. Both. Okay. Both. So we're one of the foci of the, the um, 
the second release of the project is user-generated annotations that you can sustain throughout the different visuals. So um, uh, for a good example would be a contaminant. So if you know you have a contaminant in the lab, you can flag that OTU and then that will get flagged in all the visualizations and that will in infer or it'll inform your interpretation of it. So you could do the same thing with a biologically relevant um, annotation. and. For I would love to at some point have a community curated resource of annotations too that you could just pull in as a, a visual skin. So you could um, choose what context you're in. If you're in a subsurface context, have a certain annotation. Um, so we call them style files, I guess. So you'd have, you'd have a file that you would apply um, and that would annotate all your taxa automatically. Um, so we're definitely thinking about support for both ends of that spectrum. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yes. Oh, okay. So um, I, I mentioned this on the first day, and I wanted to bring it up again, but I think it's something that data science and particularly databases can help with, which um, is disentangling life from our rock record and understanding what are the abiotic signals and what are the biotic signals, or in some sense, what is the most abiotic signal and what is the most biotic signal. And I say that because um, in exoplanets now, especially on the geology end, it's wide open. We have to try everything we can think of, but because of that, we don't know where to start. So understanding where in the parameter space of what makes a planetary surface more or less likely to host life would be really important. So I, I think of particularly the element phosphorus, which is the backbone of DNA, it's really important. Can we track phosphorus? Do we have a good map of phosphorus for the Earth and how it's changed through time with and without life? Um, I, I think these are questions that would be really valuable for the exoplanet community, especially searching for life, is understanding what are the critical aspects of geology or evolution um, or composition that are going to affect this really critical element for life as we know it. So I thought I'd bring that up. Yeah, Kamen, I'd like to follow up on that and kind of take it up one level. It's Ray Arvidsson again from Washington University in St. Louis. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the Earth. If you look at the planets, Earth is special in plate tectonics. If we go into Mercury, no. Mer Venus, kind of hell, right? The, as far as we can tell, the crust is all the same age. Maybe it turns over catastrophically, but we don't know. The moon, no plate tectonics. Mars, one plate, pla plate tectonic planet, kind of evolved and stopped relatively early. The outer planet satellites, they're summer and resident kind of orbits and heated, but nothing like the Earth. Why does Earth have plate tectonics? What's the driver? And is it related to life directly, as Tim talked about yesterday, in terms of overturn and producing the nutrients? What does the heliocentric distance have to do with it? What does the composition have to do with it? If we understand that, the connection between planetary scale activity within the solar system, the reason we have life, the role of plate tectonics, I think that helps Cayman as he kind of goes out and makes other worlds and looks at other worlds in terms of the exoplanets and it helps with astrobiology. It's probably Bob too high of a level for a focus, but I think it, it ought to be a theme or a vision that we're kind of working to because I think what will happen in this workshop, there'll be a number of things that pop out. It's probably too early to work at this top level, but we should be thinking about you know why we're doing this. Not only to understand the Earth, but Earth within a planetary system and how we can take the results to pop out to help explain what we see and understand in terms of exoplanet surveys. I completely agree. Um, put, we, putting the Earth in a context of all the other planets, would, not just in our solar system, but that we're discovering would be really important to tell us how common are planets like Earth versus, you know, are we a very unique set of parameters that made the Earth or are there many ways to get something that is Earth-like, whatever that means. I, I, I don't even think we have a de definition for what that means. Yeah, I just want to make uh, ask a question, actually. It, so there's a kind of open question about the Earth and plate tectonics. It's the extent to which uh, the behavior of the Earth today, the dynamical manifestations like plate tectonics, depend more on what happened in the past. In other words, it's inherited uh, some weaknesses and weak zones and other things from past events that are 
dominantly controlling its behavior today, or whether its behavior today is more or less a state function of the current state variables. Um, I think there's good arguments to be made for both, but this is a really important issue in, uh, in geodynamics and our ability also to address how other planets behave. And I wonder, the question is, can we, is there a way to measure this? Can all this data we have um, tell us how important is the role of inherited weaknesses, inherited mm -hmm. other things, skeletons in the closet that the Earth has in its evolution versus forgetting what happened in the past. It's just the now that matters, yeah. this kind of 2M members. Yeah, so I, I think it's uh, trying to under, yeah, that's a very high level. So understanding what is sort of a graspable problem here that big data can inform. And I, I think it's, uh, I, again, I think, you know, what, which signal on the earth is the most indicative of an abiotic so that we as the mineral physics community or the petrology community can begin measuring that so that when we go look for biosignatures, we can rule out all the geosignatures that might get in the way. So I'd like to throw this also open to the data science community. Um, we certainly have heard uh, last night, for example, Chris Johnson was very eloquent, I said, saying that they want to work with disciplined scientists. And uh, one of the things that I pointed out and I've heard multiple times from other people is this idea of multidimensional geochemical data. Is there a way that we can better um, render that in a visualization, both for discovery and also just to present in papers and, and to let people understand? I find it very difficult, for example, to understand when you have a ratio of isotopes plotted against a ratio of isotope, and then you're trying to interpret that the slope means. It seems to me there must be a better way to, to help us make those connections. Um, and so are there specific visualizations? Also this question about new, developing new analytical techniques that can be applied to small data sets that allow us to understand errors, that allow us to do approximations. And, and to give you an example of how that might work, we have, for example, extensive information on uh, the mineralogy or geological aspects of Earth. If we're going to try to say how similar or different is Mars to Earth, is there a way of taking the very small data sets that we have from Mars and saying, in a statistical sense, um, what, what aspects are similar to or different from a planet, making this a more quantitative uh, effort with errors? because it seems this could be true for microbial communities. If you have a very sparse microbial community for some place, because it's difficult to collect, for example, um, Karen, is there a way of taking that community and com compare it to much more uh, fully realized, not sparse data, but rich data that we have from other environments and saying the extent to which a particular microbial community is similar or different to something else. And this is a case where understanding sparse data, small data, might really have a powerful um, impact. Early Earth versus modern. To what extent is Earth three billion years ago different from today? If we have very little data, can we make a statistical comparison? So anybody want to? Any resonance? Uh, I'm not sure about the mineral, but with the microbes, what we do, we downsample the larger data set we have to the few instances we have on the other side. For example, if we have a lot of sampling in one place with a lot of diversity, we, we randomly downsample that to the few instances we have on the other side. We try to compare how those two diversity compare. In other words, if we had only the few observations we have for Mars, how that they would look like where, if they come to Earth. So we do this kind of downsampling. I don't know if that would work the same way, but that's something we do for our sampling. So I wanted to show a visualization, but I don't think I have the right connector. Yeah, I think I. HDR. Yeah. Can I talk while you're saying that? Okay. I'm just gonna talk. I've got a microphone. But I'm just thinking, Bob, about the sparse data. You know, I think you were implying like sparse biomass, but. The sparse data that we that's really like driving us nuts is all these unannotatable part of our genomes. So what we have there is, I mean, I consider it's a lot of data, but it's sparse because we can't say what it is or what it does. But I think this is something we've all sort of been thinking about. But if we could really go hard on this question, 
of linking those data to these unannotatable data to all the geochemical, geochemical parameters or location parameters and look at these things that we can't annotate and just see what correlates with them, then that can head us in the direction of identifying some functions. We've talked a lot about this is not my idea. Um, we've talked a lot in this meeting about that, but I think there's space there. So you, you asked about highly dimensional, dimensional data. This is not directly what this uh, group is about, but I've, I've come up with some visualizations for transcriptional regulatory networks and others uh, that, um, th that allow you to view a lot of information at once and to explore it and also to reproduce it. So this is an example of a hairball, which is a gene regulatory network. And um, you might ask, uh, and as it, looking at it, you can't really see what's going on. But generally speaking, what you want to do is you want to be able to find out uh, what is happening for particular genes. So let's look at, um, oh, and, he, and, here is a, and here is the source data that that, that, that came from. So if we were uh, interested in a particular gene, for example, EG, uh, EGR3 and AES, we could focus in on it. Um, interactively, sorry. And then say, what is connected to that? And then format that using a nice skeleton layout. And then look at the, present the labels. And, um, and this allows, so this is an, ex and, and then once we've decided that we've found some genes that are of interest, we can say, what does the experimental data say about those genes? And the biologists, um, and then once we've identified a, tr a, a condition of interest, we can say, what, is, what do the conditions say about the gene expressions? So this kind of interaction going back and forth between a transcriptional model and the experimental data uh, allows uh, the biologists I've been working with to evaluate how well their uh, statistical techniques for uh, deriving um, transcriptional regulatory networks are working and to be able to iterate and, and go back and, and, and um, uh, change the techniques uh, at, to, to produce better results. And then once they, they come up with something that's useful, they can share the information with their colleagues. And furthermore, they can reproduce the whole process because all of this is scriptable. So I, in, in this case, I'm, I've just rerun a, 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 a sequence of, of an, a, an analysis sequence automatically using this, uh, this Python, uh, uh, little Python mini script which identified genes of interest and selected expressions of interest and um, uh, uh, presented the data using z-score normalization and so forth. And um, I just wanted to, so this, um, this methodology of using Jupyter notebooks and Jupyter uh, widgets uh, in, in uh, allows you to share the information in addition to this over the um, using web services. I don't know if you've heard of something called Binder, which allows you to send to, uh, you, can, you can create a GitHub repository, and I have in this case many times. You create a GitHub repository, you put Jupyter Notebooks in it with the data, and then anyone in the world without installing any software can run analyses like these. And in fact, when the LIGO experiment came out, I believe they put out a binder notebook for it so that you could rerun the analysis. You may have seen this. Um, and um, so I just wanted to point this out, that, 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 that these techniques are available for, and, and it is very useful for, uh, for analyzing um, uh, complex data sets including highly multi-dimensional data sets. In this case, we're dealing with data sets that have, you know, 50,000 genes. That, that's 50,000 dimensions. So, and that's, that's all I wanted to say about that.
It's all open source, yeah. So are there other ideas for projects? Have you been getting together in small groups and, and come up with sort of, even just sort of modest projects that you think you might want to pursue? Um, I've heard ideas about uh, looking at the phosphorus cycle, for example, uh, which is certainly something that can link geo and bio. Are there other? Uh, what about planetary science? Have we come up with uh, something that might relate to exoplanets that's new? So our strategy, yeah, come on, come on down, Marshall, please. Um, so while Marshall's coming down, there, I think the strategy for us is going to have to be that, that we're, of course, going to consolidate the PowerPoint ideas and the things that are in the idea box, as well as the ideas we're here, we've heard today. Uh, the workshop organizing committee is going to be meeting after this plenary session to just sort of decide how we're going to, to tackle the writing. And, and the writing will certainly be involved to first give an overview and sort of a, a large scale philosophy of, of why linking um, these data resources, analytics, visualization um, with the deep time theme, well, I think that will be our a sort of a, an overview or a preamble to the whole idea. And then I think what we're going to do is try to set down as best we can descriptions of these five or six sort of thematic ideas, concise and clear ideas that are important, that could potentially act as uh, subsets of people here. Uh, we'll put these ideas together. We'll send out an email to everyone with the ideas, asking for comment, uh, corrections, additions, expansions. Also, I think we'll make a call for people who want to be leaders of these various uh, ideas. And, and if you feel like there's really something here, I'd really like to take charge of, of thinking about one of these groups. Um, see about if we can find funding for, for small workshops. It may be just half a dozen people. It may be 20 or 25, certainly not as large as this workshop. But see about forming these sub-communities and then seeing if, if you find that there's something there after a workshop, uh, looking to the funding agencies and try to move that forward. Um, this course can occur on an individual basis and each of you may have ideas that you want to uh, try to develop on your own. But I think working in small groups and, and there's a real opportunity here to make some significant advances across disciplines. So. Yep. Okay. Uh, so first, um, uh, I just created a live chat um, with uh, the Gate platform because uh, we have a large audience here, so you can hear the presentation from someone. But um, if you want to catch up, you can just go there. You can log in with uh, your Twitter account. You can log in with Facebook or Google. So you can ask questions. You can even ask like. And you can also share resources, like some URL, or just, you can even ask who is the guy who just, who just talked about an interesting topic, and then someone else may just paste his uh, Twitter ID. So basically, it's a, it's a platform for, for sharing this kind of information. And uh, it's a kind of live chat, so even after this workshop, you can still continue the discussion. Uh, it's like a web page, let me, I think, yeah, so here is an uh, example. We use this in another workshop. For the, there are really active discussions. Even when the workshop is going on, there are some online discussion among the audience. So I think maybe we can leverage this for the 4D workshop. Uh, and then about the research topic. So I have the idea about, um, oh, where is my stuff? So here, I want to share with you this um, uh, geological time scale. Actually, it also includes some biological time scale, it's what, especially paleobiology. So you can see, we all know the global geological time scale is a kind of international standard, but also they are local and regional time scale. And also for different sub-disciplines in geology, in paleobiology, people use different concepts, names, terminology. This is called heterogeneous. So in the past two and a half days, uh, in many occasions, people talk about this semantic mediation or semantic mediator. So my idea is that why we do not to create like a machine readable knowledge base for those time. 
So in this way, we can match those different times. Like when you see this table, you can say, okay, from bottom to uh, top is from old to young. There's a timeline, and then you can match those times, right, along the timeline. But machine cannot do that. Human, when we read this table, we can understand. Okay, there's a hierarchical structure, there's an ordinal structure. But for machine, when you present a label to the machine, what is the meaning? So what is the period? What is the length of the period? What is the start time? What is the end time? So my idea is to create such a machine-readable format for this model. So let me show you an, a quick example about what I mean by saying machine readable. So here. I do not want to show you this case study, I just want to show you a schema. So here is machine readable. <laughs> so this is semantic web format. Um, we do not require humans to read this. Machines can read this. So here is a list of those um, uh, codes for the global geological time scale. We set up a machine-readable hierarchical structure for the time scale. We also set up a machine-readable ordinal structure for the time scale. And we also collect the attributes for each concept in the time scale. And we also we even have multilingual labels for each concept. I think here we have about uh, labels in 20 different languages. So you can imagine, um, I think someone just mentioned to use geological maps across the world. You can think about when you put the scale, when you push the scale to global scale, you can imagine, like if you use geological map from China, you use geological map from Russia, you use geological map from France, you use geological map from Germany, the attributes may be written in their own language, in Chinese, in Russian, in French, in German. How can you recognize? It's not all written in English, right? So machine, how can machine read this? And how can machine understand the meaning, the numerical meaning behind those labels? So we can do something with this. This is called a semantic mediator. So that's just my two, point, uh, two cents for this. Um, knowledge base for deep time. I would, I would like the time when Donato sets up to put something out. We, we've been talking about connecting uh, biological and, ge and geological data for the last two and a half days. And we've also talked about lots of missing data points. Um, so I think if we really want to connect it, we should sample accordingly and we should analyze accordingly. So what we've been doing is the deep life community is sampling their sites and the, the, the geo community is sampling their sites and the isotope chemists sample their sites. Um, the only effort that was really a, a concerted effort was the, was the um, biology meets subduction. And I would highly recommend for the, for the next phase, however it might look like, to really get, get kind of away from collecting many, many data points that don't go together to, to um, concentrate on fewer sites that we all as a community uh, agree on, but then really sample and analyze everything, the microbiology, the isotopic signature, the chemistry, the geology, to really understand these ecosystems. And instead of having 500 different samples with thousands of data points that really don't go together because they're, they're patchy, have maybe 50 sites in the world that we define as the 50 most important and really uh, analyze in depth um, to get comprehensive data sets. Because then we can do things like Dwight um, is, is, is talking about we can actually connect the biology to, to the plate tectonics. And we've talked earlier about indications that we have in the, in the, in the deep life community where uh, by looking at the whole sample set that we collected, um, we can see indications that some of the variation in, in, in the communities can be explained by plate tectonic movement. So as, a, as an example, we have indications that the communities in the Fennoscandian Shield uh, and the communities in the Canadian Shield 
um, are, are very similar, and it might be because uh, they, 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 were, they were part of the same ecosystem before the Atlantic split up. So, um, but to, to, to go into depth in, in, into this indication, in this like, hypothesis that was created by that meta-analysis, we need more data points and more uh, solid, solid data. So um, I, I, would, I would love to see more concerted efforts and, and um, as a community to, to really look at all, all, all different aspects of, of selected ecosystems. Before you go, I just want to, I, I just want, uh, Josh Golden, University of Arizona, I just want to follow up on your point um, but, uh, and expand on it beyond uh, focusing on collecting this new data and, and uh, this, is, this is what we need to do. We need to, to, to start collecting uh, data from the same places, um, both from the geologic side and the bio biologic side. Um, but one thing that I've always been concerned with is maybe this information exists already throughout these various databases um, that already exist. So recognizing where the intersections between uh, the data of, of any specific type, but where are the intersections in, the, in these existing repositories? Um, I think there needs to be some, some effort um, put into recognizing uh, commonalities between all these various resources. Because uh, perhaps that data is, already exists, uh, but it's just so diffuse that it's, it's difficult to recognize. I just realized that they put up the Japanese. Well, you want to say something before I change, I try to? Oh, yeah, I'm going to say something really briefly. Um, I, I think that's a really good point, and that is something that we talked about in one of our breakouts, is that not only you know, should we be looking at all the data that we currently have that exists, but you know, there are people going out there and doing these interesting field projects and collecting a variety of different kinds of data. So I think that's something we should all be keeping in mind. You, know, you may go to your field site, and think, oh, well, there are certain parameters that aren't really that important for my field site. You know, but maybe compared to other field sites, they are important. So when you're out in the field collecting data, you know, think about that. Record the temperature that day. Record the pH. Record the time of day. Go nuts. You know, record, <laughs> record everything that you can think of because you might not think it's important at that moment. But later on, when you're looking at different data sets and comparing to what other people are doing, uh, you know, that data might end up being important and you might end up finding a correlation that you have before. So we should be, you know, not only after the fact, but as we're collecting data, you know, think about everything that you can collect. Uh, I, I wanted just to throw out a couple of things that I've been thinking for a while now in terms of practical resources we can put together. And I've been doing some work on it, but I'm not qualified to go after it alone. So I'm just throwing the ideas out. So if there's anybody interested. Have you ever seen this one before? Her scientist? I've been staring at this for a long time, and I found amazing the amount of information they were able to annotate on top of this. So I was super excited to get something like that for the biologist and see, you know, what kind of trace elements are more abundant in vents versus, you know, hot springs, and what biology can use an electron acceptor and donor, and what's the, is it easier to be found as an oxide or a sulfide and things like that. And the best I could find at the time was something like this. And the real best I found around is something like this. Major element, minor element, a sensor trace element, specialized use of some life. That's all the information. And I was thinking that from a geomicrobiologist perspective, it would be interesting to be able some, to have something like this, where it tells you, you know, uh, if that element is used in redox reaction by microbes, is preferentially used, uh, oxidized by valence 3 to valence 4. And that could help, you know, go back to some of those um, signal we could find in the geological record or the isotopic record. Do we know of uh, fractionation effects that are associated to some, on some of these elements by microbes? How large are these fractionation effects? So I've been starting to collect some of the data to try to annotate a table like this, but I don't have the expertise to realize which, which um, Ion is more abundant in hydrothermal vents versus other areas because I'm not a geochemist. So if anybody of you that is interested in helping me out to get a geo microbiologist table instead of, you know, these are, these are the important nutrients that you need to eat in your life, that's something that I think could have value for the community in searching for pattern. And the other thing I'm going to start to do 
And I have a little bit of seed money from the DCO, and I've already been speaking with Shannon about possibly getting the journal there, is the database I already mentioned about the physiological information for all cultured microbes available. And I know it can be used by a number of people to try to annotate which groups of bacteria, um, in how do they behave in relationship with temperature, pressure, pH, salinity, and similar things, and can be helpful to interpret the interface between the genomics and the phenotypic of the microbes. So I just wanted to throw that. If anybody's interested, please get in touch, and we can work together. Thank you. So just a quick comment on that idea is, um, you know, this might be a great way to drag in the chemists and the enzymologists who are doing a lot of the, um, you know, isolating an enzyme, getting the characterization of the thermodynamics, the kinetics, and how the enzyme actually behaves, and how do you actually relate that back to the organism it came from, the metabolism, the microbial community, because to actually do those kinds of studies is very difficult, and you can spend a PhD characterizing a single enzyme. Um, and how do you get that back into big data? And maybe there could be time for communication to say, you know, you're interested in these enzymes because that's what the NIH and pharma cares about, but we care about these enzymes because we're curious as to why they're different in these microbial communities. What is different about the way that the chemistry is actually working here? And so having more cross-communication with the chemistry community could be interesting there. Being able to put uh, on, you know, besides just the crude physiology of the organism, when you start to talk about its metabolism, if you could attach, you know, affinities for certain substrate, if you could attach, you know, the rates at which those substrates can be used, even if the rates that we measure in the lab are maybe order of magnitude bigger than other rates around, they can still inform some pattern with respect to phylogenetics and diversity. At the same time, we've been talking a lot that something we need to better interpret the geological record isotope is better constraint of what the effect of biology is in this isotope. And often we associate, you know, a certain um, fractionation effect to a certain metabolism, but that's based on a single point, on a single organism, and it's not even the most abundant organism in the environment. It's just whatever they had at the time in the lab. So systematically exploring this data with people that do both the enzymatics and people that can do the isotopes and tagging these with environmental relevant data could be super powerful. So yes, absolutely. I think it'll be important to decide fairly soon what is going to be the, um, the foundation, the platform for the big picture database. I mean, I, I'm attracted by the concept of G plates. I think it's got to be a, a, a tectonic platform, I think, because everything basically comes from the supercontinent cycles. Those Earth cycles are things that, that start all the processes that we're talking about through into the biology. I, is G plates the best platform? Are there alternative platforms? The problem with G plates, obviously, is it doesn't go back into time far enough. Stops what in the Cambrian. Um, if it is the best platform, is should we look at how, who and how it's going to be extended into the Proterozoic? Well, I thought Dwight's point early was was really good that we could actually have several different platforms, and I think. Maybe Peter Fox could comment on this idea also about interoperability of data resources. We could have 100, 500 different data resources. We've got yours on Pyrite. We have big ones like MinDAT and, and Rough, but there are many, many small um, data resources as well. And the key is to have them so that they're interoperable, that they're linked in such a way that it's semantically uniform so that they can all be interrogated. I think that this is something that could really be an aspiration for the community to form what is, we've begun as the deep time data infrastructure, but something that is much more widespread. So G plates becomes one very useful um, platform for illustrating certain types of information, but maybe we'll have some more abstract new kinds of visualization for geochemical data, other network and other things for paleobiology and mineralogy. All those could be available on a single portal if, if we wanted to do that. But, but Peter's the expert on this, so. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. Um, so for geographically based and 
and time-based data that are well-established, standardized web service interfaces. So, for example, if you're keen on maps, um, the web feature service, um, web coverage service, and there's a, there's a time equivalent um, that, that takes in, well, you know, you, you implement it on top of any database and you can go and query it and um, bring them together in one source. And that's what we did for the volcano gas emission. It was really very easy. Um, grad student took 30 minutes while we were in a meeting to do that. Um, so that's, that's pretty easy, but um, one thing I emphasized the other day was the real explorations, you know, don't always think multiple dimensions doesn't only mean space and time. It's, you know, we started to talk about phase space yesterday, and um, I think a lot of the unlocking that we can do is, is by looking at so-called so parametric space. Um, and that's where you're in slightly um, less firm territory um, in terms of, of putting up web services that make them available. And what I say by web services, don't get afraid, it's, it's just a command line that has some arguments in it that goes off somewhere on the web and pulls back the data in a form that you want. So if you want a map, you ask for a map. If you want an XML document that's understandable by your app, that's what you get back. You could bring back a, you know, a, a, a GIF file or something like that. And it's really just a mat matter of um, you as consumers um, listing the, the, the functional things that you want to get back. When you get it back, do you want to put it into MATLAB? Do you want to put it would you use a Jupyter Notebook, or do you need a, an app, a specialized app like some of the ones that we, we saw before? Uh, do you want it in GeoMap app, for example? So there's a variety of existing capabilities that can definitely be leveraged, and I think it's mostly people just don't know about them. Um, Hello, it's uh, Henry Poole. Um, and I, yeah, I want to just uh, have folks look into a license called the AGPL, which is a uh, open license for distribution for software as a service. And it's, I discovered an interesting thing at a project that I'd done a decade ago, and um, the software is no longer around. I lost all track of it. And this particular license has a function where you can download the source from a web page. And um, archive.org had archived the code from a decade ago. And it's important, so if you're, if you're running software and data and you want to be able to make sure that the data is available and the source code is available in the future, um, having the accessibility to the code is important. So I just wanted to recommend it to, to look at that license. Jane Hammerstrom, USGS. I think we've all learned about a lot of databases that exist that we didn't know existed. We've heard about platforms that exist, software that exists, that it's going to be important to be informed about to move forward as, as we develop whatever we develop. And so somewhere in whatever is going to come out of this, we need some place that one can go to get this information, and maybe that exists, but maybe it doesn't, and I just wanted to, to bring that up. So one other idea that had been proposed, and I know that uh, Jane reminded me of this, um, especially in collaboration with the US Geological Survey, Rob Robinson and others who are sponsors, uh, co-sponsors of this workshop, is this idea of using um, recommender systems, affinity analysis, and, and maybe at some point, uh, being able to predict the next large ore deposit. And there'd be similar applications to thinking about microbiology or to uh, any other field where we have a, dist a known distribution and known characteristics and attributes of, of deposits or certain types of physiological, biological features, and you want to predict where else those parameters might be fulfilled. So. Um, I'm just wondering the extent whether is that something that's sort of going to be a specialized USGS collaboration? Is there a, or is a more widespread interest in, in that sort of activity? I'll uh, respond a little bit, I guess. I think that it is something that we have a lot of interest in in the survey, in part 
because part of our mission is to do applied analysis, and I think it would refer both to hazards and resources in particular. Um, I think the map framework that was mentioned earlier is ideal for our analysis and use in that. And I think there are lots of ways you can integrate data together to do that, particularly looking at the distribution of resources by deposit types or even regional geochemistry over time and space. Um, so those are all be very powerful. There's other things we have that we haven't talked about as databases but are available. We have a regional uh, database of soil samples by chemistry and mineralogy across the coterminous U.S. that are characterized in three depth intervals, particularly for the, the biological community. That may be research you're not aware of, but may be very relevant to your surface sampling. And the fact that it does both chemistry and mineralogy in those soils. Um, a variety of other databases like that as well. So I think the MAP framework will be very powerful organizing frame for a lot of information and again, we need to work together in some ways to provide an information links to all the different databases that are available because that will be a powerful linking across the broader group. Uh, Ross Large again, can I make a comment on the ore deposit side? Um, I, I think it would be valuable to include ore deposits in the, the time frame because being able to put the occurrence of deposits again into the tectonic cycle, because we know that ore deposits generally form in a cyclic fashion um, and the ore deposits in the Arkeen are very different to those in the Proterozoic and we have a mixture in the Phanerozoic. So if we're going to build something, uh, and the, the two platforms we're talking about, I suppose, are the current map platform, or secondly, the plate tectonics platform, um, then it's appropriate to have ore deposits into both of them, I would think. And that would make the, the databases a lot more usable for industry also, because that's what they're going to be interested in. Where the, how do the ore deposits fit into these other cycles we're looking at. And, and it's also relevant to the, the biology. How important is the biology in producing these ore deposits? It may be very significant. Thanks for that. I, I should note that a group of us went to the Colorado School of Mines and held a two-day workshop and a group of seminars on exactly this. We met with quite a few um, mining company geologists and mining consultants and one of the real eye-openers eye for us was that they were, um, all had proprietary data and nobody was interested in sharing, um, even though the fact that the only way you're going to be able to really find new deposits, and, and they basically have leases on the land so that no one else can get at their land, and the only way that they're really going to be able to learn where the deposits are is comparing it to other areas. So this, was, this is a cultural thing that we're going to have to work on, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity <laughs> for us to, to <laughs> There's a lot of data out there that um, we might be able to convince people. Ultimately, it's worth sharing. Also, we have a lot of data on where there are ore deposits or what we might call prospects. So that's, that's telling you something about a source and a transport and a fate and some kind of an environment, in possibly a temperature pressure regime, that could um, be very informative to uh, biological communities and so on. I mean, we can get we can find acid rock drainage in the rock record where we know there were low pH conditions by, by what's left. So I, I think there could be a lot of synergy between what we have and the data sets we have and, and what you all have. And you may be surprised that some mining companies, also petroleum companies, have explored using microbes uh, to prospect. That is, there are certain communities of, of microbes that are associated with either trace elements or certain other environmental factors. It's also important when you're thinking about these ideas of recommender systems that we have a huge amount of information on places where there are not economic deposits. And that's equally important in these uh, large data approaches. Uh, I just want to follow, follow up on that point of uh, prospecting using um, uh, microbes. Because uh, my understanding is that, that you can also prospect using the plant life um, certain plants grow on certain lithologies, um, and so maybe there's some kind of useful connection. 
Yes, uh, climate zones, uh, vegetation, uh, soil types, there's a huge number of parameters. And this also shows this incredible link between the geo and bio in terms of uh, the richness of near surface environments. Dan. So I, I just wanted to, to very briefly make a really quick, like first order practical suggestion. And that is, that we've all seen, we've, uh, it has been presented over the past two and a half days, uh, a lot of different databases and platforms and things like that. And w we might want to consider just making a simple Google Doc that everybody has access to, you know, that we email out to everyone. So that has, on. oh, they're all, oh, okay. It already, uh, they're already ahead of me. Uh, yeah. So that if you're interested, yeah, in looking at a database or using, uh, you know, a platform or a visualization technique that, that Chris Johnson showed us or that Dawn has shown us or that Marshall showed us or Holly showed us, you know, any of those that everybody can just go to that list. So, okay, so it, it exists. It exists. Are we going to get... Links will be going out. Oh, okay. A, a big listing of it. Okay. So it's also on Twitter as well. If you search for the, the hashtag for this event, it should be a fairly useful post. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even need to. So I just wanted to touch on this uh, idea of bringing together environmental data and biological data to make predictions of distributions. And I've been working on this project where you, are, where you take satellite data and um, global distributions of environmental data from things like the World Ocean Atlas. And you can predict using this uh, the presence of particular genes, in particular, uh, for this example, key marine uh, mi microbes. And you can maybe think about doing things like you predict global distributions of these genes, which I've already made a bunch of maps that you can do this. So if you're looking for a particular gene that maybe has something to do with bioprospecting or something like that, you could think about that. And I think um, if you can get larger data sets together than what I've been able to get so far, you can start thinking about doing better jobs of predicting complex functions and biogeochemical functions. And we can start thinking about doing things like explicitly incorporating biology into Earth system models and building these sort of interconnected feedbacks of geochemical and biological models in the future and possibly in the past. Thank you. Uh, Peter mentioned earlier something called the Information Quality Act. And um, this is probably completely way out of the box, but um, a uh, to nationalize science data. You know, there's a, you're, you're, we're talking about a lot of great data and an act to nationalize it. That's it, out of the box. Like if there is, if there's important science that can help us uh, learn things about our planet, we could just nationalize the data. <laughs> an act to nationalize the data. What does nationalize mean in this context? Well, nationalizing, uh, you can nationalize your banks. You can nationalize your oil reserves, right? You can nationalize data. It's, we're, we're saying it's owned, apparently. I have people collecting uh, data on my farm that I don't own. Um, there's a lot of data that, and we're all scientists here, most of us, um, and we have private companies that own the data. So you could nationalize it. I, you know, I said it probably wouldn't be popular, <laughs> but it's an idea that's out of the box here. How, how is nationalizing different than just making it open source? Um, well, it's not really. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be any different than that. But you're basically taking away property from someone who owns it. And, you know, it's actually arguable that data is not owned by anyone anyway. Um, you can't really copyright certain things. But the people are treating it as, the, as though they own it. And it's important for science, especially when you are looking at things like our planet um, and the diversity dying off. Do we, and could, could a community like this actually stand up and take a, a, a stance like that? So one comment that we learned at Colorado School of Mines in Australia any public land, if you have a lease or a mine, any data you have on that property has to be public. In the United States, it's, it's not at all true. So that's, that is something we can think about as a cultural down the road, but we're a long way from Australia at this point, uh, physically <laughs> and, 
and <laughs> All right. culturally. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm uh, foreign from this community, so. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Now I just feel homesick. <laughs> uh, just a word on national. Um, uh, there are national data centers in the United States, and um, a part of succession plan for a lot of the institutional repositories and domain repositories, their strategy is to migrate their holdings to a national or a world um, data facility. And those data facilities used to be pretty much archives, but they're now becoming active, and they have a lot of resources that go with them, and they're funded by federal funds. So there are there's certain sustainability um, attributes to them that could be very, could be very desirable. Um, and then you've got resources that, you know, and this, we're talking about USGS and we're talking about NOAA and NASA and FDA and, uh, I'm sorry, USDA and, and places like that. And these are nationally recognized. Um, NOAA is um, legally bound by Congress to store all environmental data in perpetuity. That's an act of Congress. Now, of course, you know how it works in the US. Acts of Congress and appropriations to support that are two different things. Um, but if you want to get big and grand and think about this resource not disappearing, um, that, might be so that might be something to consider. I want to thank you all. This has been an intense three days. And we have come to the end of the 4D workshop. But this is not really an ending. This, I think, is, is a very exciting beginning. I see a community developing. I see pockets of real uh, co collaboration and cooperation. I think we have some very clear, uh, definitive goals, concise, clear, important things that we can do. There are other broader scale aspirations, I think, that have to do with building a culture and a community that, that may take decades, it may take generations, but we have to start and we have an opportunity to, to be leaders in that beginning. So I want to thank you all once again. Um, you'll be hearing from us. This is uh, not the last of uh, the activities associated with this workshop. And we'll be getting you uh, some reading material fairly soon. There's the website. We're going to have other resources. We'd like to hear from you with your ideas and, and your input and let's keep this conversation going. Thank you all very much. Safe travels, and we'll get back. <laughs>